Welcome to episode 184 of the Grip Strip Podcast, the hard work pays off edition of the Grip Strip Podcast. My name is Philip Matthew. I'm your host. I'm with my co host, the iRacing Indy 500 champion, computer genius, gentleman, and a scholar, and someone that I was able to finally meet after we've been, we've known each other for 10 years. His name by going to Waffle House. His name is Josh. You're fine. What's going on, brother? Hey, I'm doing great, Phil. And of course, um, yeah, I was glad to finally get in touch in person. And yeah, what a way to do it by going to the Waffle House. So of course, the um, staple of the South in terms of breakfast. And, you know, had a nice, nice breakfast there. Nothing crazy happened, unlike what we see in those uh, viral videos on on the internet and everything so yeah glad to do that and of course went to the race on saturday uh watched the coke zero 400 um went with uh two of my friends that i've known for a long time up in jacksonville and um you know they really enjoyed it and everything but yeah we'll get into it but yeah of course uh, uh glad to be back on for another week of the show yeah and you end up m- meeting up with uh joe joe Passero, a That's long you. time contributor uh for us and a friend of the show and friend of ours both and you were able to go and meet up with him and hang out so that was cool uh that uh would have been cool to do that on my end but you know we have to we'll we'll figure out something but plenty to discuss from the coke zero 400 uh christopher busher uh on a green white checkered gets his third victory of 2023 and moves himself into the top five in points in the process, led two laps in, on his way to his third win of the season. Uh, his teammate and car owner, Brad Keselowski, finished second. It was an interesting race, a lot of relatively quick race. Uh, only three cautions for 18 laps. Uh, the big wreck, uh, the stage one, I think, they ended up Again, the big wreck ended up being the stage two caution. And then, and then they had the, the last yellow was one that we're going to discuss in detail here, uh, in a little bit. We also, so we'll talk about everybody that made the playoffs. We'll also talk about the incidents that probably marred the race. We will get into the Xfinity Wawa 250, which saw, uh, saw Justin Allgaier finally get a super speedway victory uh in uh in the xfinity series went to it was 100 yeah so they ran another 10 laps and so the scheduled distance was 100 laps they ran 10 laps over because they had i think what two green white where they had three green white checkers there so look into that the truck series Ran at the Milwaukee Mile for the first time since 2009. Uh, Ty Majeski, who had won the first race of the playoff at Indianapolis Raceway Park, and uh, his crew chief, Joe Shear Jr., were nailed for um, illegal modifications to uh, the right rear tire. Um, whatever the specifics, we don't really know, but it's that holy trinity of, of messing with vehicles. Uh, he is locked into the next round, but he lost the fine. Joe Shears fined it, or fined it, fined 25 grand and suspended the next four races. And it probably is something that could um, affect their situation moving forward in the rest of the uh, playoffs. Uh, the uh, didn't put that in there, but and also Kurt Busch officially announcing his retirement from racing. Uh, due to the concussion uh, ongoing uh, issues he's had with um, recovering from the concussion he suffered, the latest concussion he re- he suffered at Darlin or Pocono Raceway last, yep, last summer. Year. Um, and Gateway for IndyCar, Scott Dixon proving once again why he's a goat, um, making a strategy that basically no other human being could w- make work work winning two consecutive races and make keeping it interesting uh it's probably still not uh gonna happen but it is scott dixon he has done weird he has done the unusual to go and win championships uh that's how you win six championships so we'll get in all that um some of the silly season uh news that has come out here 
uh, in the uh, recent week, last week or so. So we'll uh, do some announcements and uh, get into that. Uh, Formula One, uh, same shit, a uh, different day. And, um, and talk about uh, with uh, one race in first round. Um, talk about that and uh, other uh, interesting happenings at the Dutch Grand Prix, which was a mixed weather race, uh, bad bad strategy calls by certain teams, uh, put certain drivers in a, on the back foot, but, you know, it's kind of par for the course. We'll get into what happened there, move into Homestead, or Monza, why am I saying Homestead? I must be, like, completely out of it. Moving on to Monza. Uh, one of the historic races in the Formula One calendar. We'll talk about fantasy football here as we are less than a week away in live time from when we're recording this from uh, the start of the NFL season and uh, takeaways from the preseason itself, which I'll probably have a rant uh, coming uh, at that point. Round Trey up, Lance so, being traded. Yeah, yeah, Trey Lance being traded. And uh, the way that Kyle Shanahan and uh, John Lynch seemingly do business. Um, we'll, the roundup will be short and sweet. Indy next. Uh, IMSA GT. We'll have F2 and F3. F2 last week at Zanfort, but both series this week. MotoGP, Moto2 at Barcelona. And uh, the granddaddy of them all, the uh, U.S. Nationals at Indy this weekend. Anthony Wayne Stewart trying to win the Wally at Indy, um, hopefully not trying to carry on the tradition he had in NASCAR and IndyCar where he couldn't win the big one. Uh, hopefully he can get the big one here at uh, at uh, Raceway Park or at IRP um, and win the, win the big go. Uh, preview the Italian Grand Prix behind Dick Lips and um, IndyCar Portland two races to go in the season. Uh, Alex Pillow on the cusp of a second IndyCar championship. Can Scott Dixon continue to dig into that gap? Cup and Xfinity will be at Darlington. Xfinity still has a couple races to go in their regular season. Cup starts their first round in the Southern 500. Uh, Josh will talk about all things uh, in sim racing gaming in his sim segment. Uh, I even got to run a sim on the cruise that I was on for a few days so that was nice um i wasn't the fastest guy but i wasn't the slowest guy so uh, i can actually take solace in that and then we'll call call it a day so let's go with uh, the race you are at josh the coke zero sugar 400 at daytona um as i mentioned christopher busher and uh, brad keselowski give rfk a one two finish Again, that was the second time here uh, in the three races that Busher has won that he um, that the teammates finished one two I think right or no Richmond Richmond they were one two but then Brad fell back or something like that so that is the first time they've actually finished one two yep. uh, Ford's got four of the top five spots you had uh, twenty two drivers lead uh, in this race out of the 39 cars that were in the race. Um, trying to see the laps, who led the most laps, or in some of the other details. But uh, at Busher, Keselowski, Almarola, Elliott trying to make it in on a Hail Mary, Joey Logano, Alex Bowman, Kyle Busch, William Byron, Kevin Harvick, who was leading in regulation and then uh, got swallowed up in overtime. Corey LaJoy, Ty Dillon, or Corey LaJoy 10th, Ty Dillon 11th. Uh, so that probably is the best combined finish for Spire ever. Uh, Bubba Wallace 12th, and he ends up making it into the Cup Series playoffs for the first time in his career. Michael McDowell from tailback to 13th. Austin Hill and Chandler Smith, two Xfinity drivers, 14th and 15th, and so on. Um 25 cars finished on the lead lap. Martin Truex Jr. won stage one and locked up the regular season championship. Uh, stage two was won by Brad Keselowski, 
but um, I think I think we'll we'll go first talk about Christopher Busher and the move he was able to make on the green white checker to go and get the victory and um, the fact that now he's won three races here in a short period of time on three different types of racetracks and then we'll get into the two major incidents that took place um, on Saturday night involving uh, Ryan Blaney and Ryan Priest but. I mean, you were there, Josh. Um, how was the race? How did it feel like the momentum, the energies that were going on there? And um, what was it like when um, when you you saw, you know, Chris Buescher be able to go and make that move to get that victory? And also, I don't know what people were thinking in the stands when Brad was driving in circles on the back stretch because his car was on fire. Yeah, I mean, you know, even though, you know, this race definitely had its moments and everything, I mean, I liked that it was only two uh, cautions for cause in this race, you know, not counting the first stage caution. But, um, I mean, just in general, I mean, it seemed like a bigger event than maybe in years past. I mean, I haven't been to the Coke Zero 400 itself since uh, probably 2013, but I mean, I've been to plenty of Daytona races and I mean, I remember back then it seemed like the race definitely had uh, a lot of people there for that one. And then this one, I mean, it seems like in the last couple of years from social media sentiment, just gauging based off of, you know, what you see on the TV and, uh, you know, from what people in the stands, you know, pictures on social media, you know, all that stuff. It seemed like maybe like there hadn't been as many people at this race, but, you know, even even though all of that seemed like this year that there definitely was a lot more people and everything. So, um, you know, the crowd is definitely, you know, into it, uh, throughout, uh, the race, you know, it seemed like, you know, they had, you know, had, had their opinion and everything. Of course, um, you know, I think, I think, you know, you speak to if they're Bubba Wallace fans or Chase Elliott fans or whatever, they were happy about, you know, or not happy about certain things, you know, especially Chase Elliott fans, probably not happy that he didn't make the playoffs and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, you have all that, um, but, uh, the ending, um, I mean, I was fine with the ending, you know, the restart there, Chris Buescher taking the lead, uh, you know, from Kevin Harvick there on the final lap and then kind of going uncontested that final lap and everything, which, you know, I'm fine with, like, you know, don't need to have, it doesn't always have to be dramatic, like where, you know, you have two cars coming side by side to the line. I mean, of course, it's exciting, but, you know, they made the move that they needed to make with, uh, Brad Keselowski and Chris Buescher are making making moves to win the race, and um, you know, I guess you could question Keselowski wanting to finish in second rather than go for the win. But you know, with this car, you know, with how much drag it has, you know, if he tries to go for the win, it easily brings Harvick back into that equation, or even somebody like uh, Chase Elliott um, back in there, even Eric Almirola. So um, you know, which I guess for Ford, you know, the, uh, Eric Almirola winning. You know, corporately, that's good, I guess, getting him into the playoffs. But, um, yeah, I think Brad wants to try to help his team. That's kind of why he stayed in line. Gives a good shot for Busher to get up to the, you know, the uh, playoffs and uh, have a set of playoff points uh, that he can use um, and give himself better seating um, as, you know, we start the playoffs here in Darlington next weekend. So, um, you know, definitely a, a good, a good race overall, I think. Um, you know, the crowd there with uh, Brad Keselowski going in circles. Um, yeah, that was an interesting moment. I'm still trying to figure out what happened during the wreck and everything, trying to figure out, um, you know, was Ryan Abilene okay? You know, that was a huge wreck there on the, on the uh, you know, last lap of stage two on lap 95. And, you know, one thing I will mention is um, you know, after I met up with Joe, you know, during second stage, I went up to um, the 490 section. We were in the 370 section and actually made it there a quick amount of time left during the caution was able to make it as they were coming to the green. And Joe was like really surprised because it was like, wow, you walk really fast. And I was like, yeah, I, you know, I do a lot of exercise and all that stuff. So I was able to get up there pretty quickly. But, um, you know, after we met up and everything, um, you know, they got really aggressive, got three wide about like, you know, lap 50, lap 60. That is, you know, very much three wide racing throughout the field and i was telling them you know they're gonna wreck here soon maybe lap 60 it didn't happen and then you know get back down in the stands and everything and then um 
you know, with the way that they started racing towards the end, I was like, yeah, they're going to wreck here before the end of the stage. And then sure enough, Ryan Blaney gets right rear hooked by Ty Gibbs, gets a bad bump draft from Christopher Bell. And then Bell or, you know, Gibbs gets into uh, Blaney and then, you know, off from there, Blaney gets head on shot into the wall, kind of like, you know, kind of like Dale Earnhardt's wreck. A lot of people talking about that in uh, 2001, but you know, go back to um, 2012. Remember the last lap crash there coming to uh, the line, uh, with I, I think Kurt Busch also had a, a or Ricky Stenhouse had a pretty bad hit head on back in 2012 uh, that nationwide ser- uh, series opener back in 2012 if you all remember that but um, that that one I just remember that one there but yeah definitely definitely a hard impact so it was kind of concerned for you know Ryan Blaney being able to get out but you know he's able to get out and everything so yeah it was definitely an interesting uh, scenario there with all of that and then Kozlowski car getting on fire and then um, going in circles and of course people on social media and everything debating whether that should have been legal i mean you know car setting on fire i mean you know got to find a way to put it out so um you know it's not like he's repairing pre i guess you know something had happened before the red flag like you know starting marlin 2002 daytona 500 goes out and repairs the fender it's not anything like that it's literally like they're on the red flag and then sets on fire and everything so goes on fire so you know i think that's valid for something driver safety and all that so got to figure out a way to take care of that but um you know you have that and then um i think right around that time also we had the uh spacex falcon 9 rocket launch so that was actually pretty interesting as well and honestly i had no idea that it was happening um i had thought that there was already a rocket launch that happened so you know definitely um that was surprising to see but um good good sight and definitely a good uh um, you know, photo opportunity there. So Joe was able to get a good photo there and send that to me. So definitely like that and, uh, save that one, send it to all my friends and everything. And, um, I guess, you know, not, all, not all that often do you see a rocket launch, uh, at the race, you know, like that. And honestly, it was a good view. So yeah, I was glad to see that happen and everything. And then of course, um, yeah, the red flag there and then get back to racing and everything. So, um, uh, I mean, I, I like that there wasn't a whole lot of cautions, like I said, I mean, not really a big fan of having them. And, um, you know, the fact that they're able to race for so long and race three wide, two wide without getting into each other, you know, except for Ryan Priest and, you know, the Blaney crash there, the big one, um, not having that happen, I think that's a huge plus because, um, I think makes it, makes it better, you know, for, for the fans and, um, you know, makes them look, uh, competent. Of course you saw Xfinity have their issues and everything. So I guess it's better that the Xfinity series, the lower series has all the mishaps and all the crashes and the cup series looks a little bit more professional in terms of, you know, how they're able to race on super speedway being that close together. But yeah, overall, I think, you know, it was definitely a great event to go to. Um, you know, definitely glad my friends were able to come with me and, you know, I think they, they thoroughly enjoyed it and everything. And, um, you know, I, had given them a document of all the drivers and tried to give them as much context and then, you know, why this race is important. Why do we care about, you know, this race at this particular time with the playoffs and, uh, everything. And, um, you know, what was all at stake, uh, for this one. So, you know, definitely, definitely glad that, you know, I was able to, uh, do that. And, um, you know, they, from the document, it seemed like, you know, they liked Ross Chastain and, uh, Ryan Blaney. So, um, yeah, Chastain, uh, they were hoping for him to, get to the win but you know i think he got shuffled out of the draft um on the after the last set of green flag pit stops uh bubba wallace i think shuffled them out of the draft uh when they were trying to catch there in the second pack trying to catch the first pack and then um, got shuffled out there and then wasn't really able to recover kind of stayed two side by side with uh for for too long with uh, one of his uh with, yeah with his teammate daniel suarez and a couple of other cars so he wasn't able to recover but yeah um i mean Chastain was cool watching him and then, um, you know, just seeing, seeing all the racing, everything. So, um, yeah, I was definitely glad to, uh, be there. And of course, um, I mean, I didn't, I did mention Joe and everything quick story on that. Um, so I was at the Chevy display waiting for the drivers and then I see Joe on the other side and I'm like, is that really him? And then I looked at my phone, went back to my phone and looked and it's like, look at the picture I had from october when we met up in disney and everything and looked at him over you know, on the other side i'm like is that really him and i, I wasn't sure and everything was hard to tell 
and there's another guy staying next to him. I thought it was maybe his dad, but his dad's wearing, or this person was wearing a Kyle Bush hat. And I was like, I mean, they're both Chase Elliott guys, and that doesn't um, add up there. So I wasn't sure. It kind of threw me off. And then uh, later on, I texted him. I was like, were you at the race? And he's like, yeah. And then we um, tagged up uh, and everything on Twitter and, like, you know, coordinated. And he was like, yeah, I'll meet up during stage two. So, yeah, that was cool and everything. And then, uh, of course, being able to link up. So um, I guess he's in Florida now or something. So I guess maybe we'll try to link up later again for one of the races or, or something or potentially hit up Homestead when Dale Jr. races there for his one-off in Xfinity. So, yeah, we'll figure out something there. But, yeah, that, definitely glad to see him there and you know, definitely glad to, you know, be there at the race, you know, with my friends and everything. So, yeah, of course, um, yeah, that was uh, definitely a great race uh, that we saw there on Saturday. Yeah, and I mean, uh, when it comes to speedway racing you're gonna have a lot of different players a lot of people that are able to compete but as long as it's uh, not a complete demo derby the cream will rise to the top and in the case of busher and keselowski ever since the next gen car has come into play the rfk team has been good at uh, this style of racing they just haven't been able to close the deal well they did now uh you look at i i mean i wanted to go and i have to go and go back on this just out of curiosity but the um you know go to that but i mean you go through what the race the what the 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 big stories that came from the race other than uh chris busher third victory of the year um uh, you know then you talk bubba wallace making uh, the playoffs and on the flip side William Clyde Elliott the second and Alex Bowman amongst a group of guys who didn't make the playoffs a guys who uh had uh, made who made the playoffs last year Daniel Suarez is another one that made the playoffs that missed um you know you got Chase Briscoe who ended up leading the most laps in the race started on pole uh it didn't his he was he had led he led early in the race the first 22 laps he led for 45 laps late in the race and his but the pit stop sequences um shuffled him out and i mean the the fact is you had people out there that were were solid you know drivers last year the 18 car now is a 54 doesn't make it i mean there's there's a lot of cars that drivers that were in the playoff that didn't make it this year only 13 winners in 2023 relative to what is it 15 so two less winners in the regular season and i think there was 19 total winners by the end of uh 2022 i think was the right number because all three races of round one were won by non non-playoff guys yeah, yeah so yeah they, they, there's so it's 18 and then i'm trying to remember who was the 19th off off the top but um we can look I at think it we only had 18 because it, it didn't set a record um so i think 2011 had the record with 19 yeah, 19 but yeah yeah i think they had 18 last year okay yeah that makes that makes sense um and so you look at that the way the the parody was this year there really wasn't as much uh but i think seeing rfk come back into relevance is huge when ford has been at a deficit all year uh kevin harvick actually showing a little bit of life knowing that this is the end of the road for him there is a chance that he might be able to win a race in his final year um he's gonna need more help than some other drivers but you know, it's Kevin Harvick and Rodney Childers. There's so much turmoil and stuff going on at SHR. It's not an ideal circumstance. Uh, I mean, last year they had two cars in the playoff. Now they only have one. Don't know what's going to happen with them. And uh, Ryan, we'll, we'll look at it this way. I mean, Ryan Blaney gets right-reared by Keebler Gibbs because Chris Bell makes a stupid, um, stupid bump draft in the corner because he seems to do that at every super speedway race um gibbs is not for as good as he thinks he is um he can't see over the dashboard so you know he's not going to be able to save it and um that wreck was huge uh made me 
sick, you know, just seeing that hit. Uh, but Blaney getting out of the car and being able to walk away, thankful for that. Um, there's still a lot more work that really could be done with this car in, in terms of the crash structures and um, being able to soften the impacts. Um, the other one was the pre-steal, which uh, Eric Jones has been a weapon most of this year, and he uh, hit Priest in the back of the draft there, and Priest went across the nose of Chase Briscoe's teammate. Briscoe had led the most laps. Priest would had a decent run going, and Priest went on to go and make Sports Center for all the wrong reasons, and um, destroyed his 41 car. He was in the hospital, and uh, it's yet another example. Uh, no neck, uh, the SRX champion. No neck basically came out and said, "I'm not crazy enough to drive these cars on on tracks above mile and a half. They've I've, they've already made two bars named after me. I don't want a third <laughs> because they have the one bar that goes in down down the, the windshield, bar. the Newman bar. Then there's another one that I wasn't aware of. He said there's two that are named after him in the car now." because of wrecks that he has had at either super speedways or in general. And uh, he hates super speedway racing. So I think that wreck with Ryan Priest was really, really bad. The fact yeah. that these cars take off in a way that it reminds me of Rusty Wallace in 1993, when you have a whole, the whole bottom of the car is basically sealed. And they're like, oh, we can't have grass. But... There's paved road and you still take off. It's it's an it's a speed issue and it's an aero issue and it's the way the car the yaw whatever they don't have the that uh, piece like they had the they have that little I I think they have that little piece on the left side still in between the windshield the, and the spoiler the uh, shark fin yeah there's like a mini shark fin but the I think there has to be some sort of corrective measure in terms of either putting a bigger shark fin or there has to be um, shark fins on both sides of the deck lid. And instead of having the stupid 450 horsepower package or whatever it is at, at super speedways, they need to up the horsepower to what they run at uh, regular races, which I think is 550 or thereabouts. 670. I don't... Okay, so I think they need to make a compromise. All right, so thank you for that. I need to make a compromise with the the horsepower and so that there could be a little bit of separation. I think the notion of being able to bring the slingshot back into uh, play is is something that should be looked at instead of being in a pack and waiting for somebody to destroy half the field. I'm, I've been outspoken in this and how much I dislike uh, super speedway racing. Uh, Josh and Joe, of course, being Dale Jr. fans, love super speedway racing. Yeah. But then he was one of the greatest at it. Uh, if you were an, a fan of an Earnhardt, I don't think you had a problem with it. Or Jeffy. Um, but if you're a Tony Stewart fan, you definitely did because he sucked at it. Um, except for like he a period good. of... <laughs> for, no, he sucked at it except for a period of time from July of oh well there's like i guess we can go to oh four when he should have won the daytona 500 and all the way to the seven daytona 500 when he got destroyed and uh, destroyed that great car um that was when he was actually really really good otherwise he was the drizzling shits um I mean, when he had well, chance he has, he, has four, he has those four xfinity wins every year he was always a lock to win the xfinity series every year yeah but that's essentially you know, that's that's the participation medal winning the three hundred at Daytona. It's uh, what you want you want the Harley Earl trophy, you never won it. And um it, yeah. as somebody who hasn't seen his favorite driver win the Daytona five hundred since he was a very little child, it still bothers me. So the you got instead of it being a demo derby, instead of it being a a flip of a coin there, you have to give put the racing back in the driver's hands. It should be about having a driver race car. 
but it really isn't. And to me, the wrecks like for Ryan Priest are just brutal and unnecessary. And, you know, the Blaney thing was just stupidity on the part of the Gibbs guys. And there's guys out there that just drive like idiots. And, you know, the, that's unfortunate, but there's no recourse for that kind of action, uh, unfortunately. And that's where it goes down to these lower levels where you see dipshits like Sawalich and Jesse Love and uh, Hingarani and whoever that run over everybody and think it's okay. It isn't okay. And when you're doing it at 195 miles an hour, you're going to end up going and doing a, some sort of death-defying uh, evil can evil shit. Um, and it's it's not it isn't it doesn't make any sense. I mean, the IndyCar guys basically said they can't go to Pocono anymore because they say it's too dangerous. I say that they're too stupid to uh, police themselves, and that's a perfectly fine racetrack to race around. But they couldn't police themselves. These guys can't police themselves, and NASCAR's too stupid to realize that. And they also don't have a race car that um, functions in a manner that can make racing happen. They just want a uh, overrated demolition derby. And that one of those is determining the biggest race of the year. The most, the, the race that everybody looks at, that every driver wants in their career, too. So that's my two cents. But it doesn't take away that Chris Buescher won the race um, and that Darrell Walsh Jr. was able to lock into the playoffs. He was really. Um, really stressed out had a lot of uh agina and and anxiety through the whole week kyle petty shit on him and then he basically came back and and responded with kind of a non kind of took the high road um on kyle petty while other people may have had their uh went a little further with it i mean i don't know the aggro of, by which kyle uh, when at Darrell Walsh Jr. was necessary, but also once Bubba went out there and said, look, I did my media uh, availability and my obligation on Wednesday, the week of the race, asked permission not to have to do uh, press after that, and it's a perfectly uh, fine request. Anybody can do it, and uh, he wasn't the only one that didn't take a post-race interview. And uh, but because it's Bubba, everything is magnified because it's him. But after all of this, he makes the playoff. He has a chance at uh, at a driver's championship this year after driving the 45 car last year in terms of the owner's points and getting them, I think, to a top 10 finish or whatever, top 12 finish in the points last year. So um we have the, we'll just go over the 16 um, in uh, in the points here. Just move over that. Going into the, the Southern 500 this weekend, um, Will Byron and Martin Truex start equal at 2,036 points because Truex got the 15 playoff point bonus. They're 11 points ahead of Denny Hamlin. Busher moves up to fourth. I may have said fifth, but he's fourth. Uh, Kyle Busch, fifth. Uh, he is uh, 17 points back. Larson, 19 points back and sixth. And then Chris Chris Bell, uh, 22. Uh, yeah, 22 points back. Uh, Chastain, 25. Keselowski, 26. Braddock, 27. And uh, defending series champion Joey Logano, and his teammate Ryan Blaney, uh, 28 back. The four drivers that are outside of the cutoff as we start the playoffs are Michael McDowell, who won at Indy just a few weeks ago, Richard, who won the Daytona 500, Kevin Harvick in his final year, and aforementioned uh, Darrell Wallace Jr. Um, I look at this kind of, I think I look after the, and we'll talk about it more later, but. I look at the guys from the, the top four as one piece. After that, from 5th to 16th, I think there's a lot of volatility that could take place. And uh, that's probably what's going to make 
the playoff more interesting uh, than it might have been in other years, in my opinion. But the uh, Wawa 250 at Daytona saw Justin Allgaier get his 21st victory in the series, his second win of the year, his first uh, super speedway victory, as I mentioned earlier in the open. Uh, Sheldon Creed, yet again, gets a second place finish. He had a chance. He was leading late. Uh, finishes just short of that um, that maiden victory in the Xfinity Series. Uh, Daniel Hemrick finishes third. Parker Kligerman fourth after announcing that he'll be back with uh, Big Machine in 24. Cole Custer fifth. Ryan Sieg starting tailback with uh, multiple penalties or whatever with his new sponsor. Finishes sixth. Parker Retzloff. Seventh, Anthony Alfredo, Gray Galding, Justin Haley in the 10 car rounds out the top 10. Jeffrey Earnhardt was 11th and Jeb Burton 12th. Uh, credit to uh, Kyle C., Joey Gase, and Jordan Anderson with his father in law uh, as his crew chief, you know, uh, Miss America's crew chief, old Larry Mack Reynolds. Um, the uh, stage winners, Austin Hill won the st first stage. And uh, Sheldon Creed won the second. They swapped positions in the first two stages. And the two RCR cars were first and third in laps led. Uh, Trevor Bain, driving the 19 for Gibbs, led the second most laps, uh, but shuffled back after an accident late in the race. I think the early wreck was, uh, was a bunch of the back marker people and Brockshot Jones and then it also involved Natalie Decker going and ARCA breaking her way into a crash. Joe Graff Jr. being Joe Graff Jr. in their weatherman. Then there was the accident, I think, that shows that was Clements, Williams, John Hunter, Bain, Yaley, or, or, I think were all involved in it. I think Baccarella and Ellis wrecked with each other, the teammates. So, I mean, for Creed, still... He's right on the cusp of getting that victory. I think he really wants to be able to get that victory prior to the start of the playoffs to give himself a chance. He has won in the truck series. He's won the Xfinity, or he's won the ARCA title and truck title. Um, Austin Hill is arguably the favorite with uh, John Hunter Nemechek, but yet again uh, comes close, but no cigar as uh, all guy who has never really been known for being uh, the best super speedway racer, finally gets a super speedway victory and uh, gives himself a little bit more uh, support in terms of his uh, opportunity to win the uh, championship in 2023, Josh. Um, what, are your, what did you take away? And actually moved up with uh, the issue for John Hunter Nemechek, moved up to second in points. He's a point ahead of John Hunter Nemechek. Uh, with the regular season title, with two races to go in the regular season. So, uh, what are your your takeaways on uh, Allgaier's victory and Creed uh, and his uh, prospects moving into the postseason? Since he's more basically he's locked in, but or not locked in. I can't. I sh I shouldn't say that he isn't truly locked in. I mean, the points are a bit iffy, but they're not like crazy crazy bad for him yeah of course and you know i think with just nagar you know finally getting a super speedway win um you know he's come close several times um had a chance in the spring you know the um 300 that he could have won uh the nation in the xfinity series um earlier this year could have won that really junior motorsports could have won that one um but you know they didn't really have uh that opportunity they kind of fumbled the bag later late but this one you know comes back um was really committed to uh brandy jones and i think you know after that uh brandy jones got taken out you know i think it was just him on his own trying to go and uh win the race and everything so um you know for algar you know it's a good win because um you know finally gets a super speed win but you know also like you said uh definitely um gives him uh more foundation to fall fall back on when it comes to you know this uh, whole playoff deal and everything so um a little bit more stability there so you know uh finally getting a win there gives some confidence to you know do it again of course you know they have uh talladega coming up in the fall the nationwide series so um 
you know, now you got to think about him as somebody who could probably or possibly win uh, on a uh, track like Talladega, very similar to Daytona. So, um, yeah, I think uh, it's a good good win for him. You know, for Sheldon Creed, um, came really close. You know, honestly, watching that on the final lap, I uh, really thought that maybe he might have the the win there in the bag because um, he did nose ahead there for a second uh, on that last lap uh, with, uh, you know, with, with Justin Algar, but Algar was able to side draft him back, back into the lead and everything. So, uh, you know, definitely could have, could have would have stood there for uh, Sheldon Creed. You know, I think Creed had that, I think if he would have just tried to side draft him a little bit more, probably could have slowed him down, but maybe he just doesn't have uh, that experience on the, um, Xfinity side when it comes to being able to um, you know steal a win there on the last lap like that uh, so maybe you know just doesn't have that ability yet but you know I guess he'll learn for next time there but um, you know for him you know even though he doesn't win still good finish um, it's better than getting wrecked on a super speed uh, speedway and losing points and um, that's something you never want to see um, but you know for uh, for him uh, being able to do that you know that's a definitely a um, more favorable there so um, it, it's coming close you know at some point he's going to win he's um, I think by the end of the year we'll be talking about him having at least one win so we'll we'll see how that happens um, yeah, I think also you know you got to talk about the points battle you know with the top two um, of course Austin Hill finishes the race I mean led the most laps uh, finished one lap down in 23rd but John you know John Hunter Niemicek, um gets taken out and finishes in 28th so you know, a difference of five spots uh, in there, plus the stage points, um, kind of tilts the favor back in into um, John or in uh, Austin Hill's hands here, and um, also you know opens the door for possibly Justin Algar if he goes on a hot streak. You know, these last couple of uh, races before uh, the the playoffs, you know, gives him a shot to possibly you know get in there, but you know Austin Hill um, kind of damage control, being able to lead laps, uh, you know. Um, you know, first stage, getting lap led, second stage, uh, finishing second. So, you know, definitely a better better result for him there, um, even though he ended up, you know, one lap down in 23rd. So, yeah, I mean, this race, you know, like we talked about earlier, contrasting it with the cup race and the Xfinity race, um, you know, this is where all the action in terms of wrecks happen. You know, like you said earlier, people losing it on, you know, the super speedways and stuff. So, um, yeah, um, I have a little bit of contrast there, which is, I guess, is okay, but... You know, definitely, um, at least, you know, for me, you know, watching this race, how it, is, how it unfolded on, you know, with um, multiple extended finishes, um, green, white trackers, uh, overtime, as they call it now. But, um, you know, contrasting that to Saturday, I was hoping we didn't have to go into overtimes multiple times. So, um, yeah, this race going into overtimes multiple times, I think if I'd attended, you know, I'd be like, oh, this is taking forever to finish and everything, got to stop wrecking, all that stuff. So um, definitely think, um, you know, other than other than that, I think you know it was definitely a good race to be seen. You know, and as a you know, junior motorsports guy, you know, finally finally glad that Justin Algar got a win at Daytona. Yeah, and it's it's good for the team, and I think the morale. I know Junior's been on them to try to work together, and it hasn't worked out a lot so far this year. Uh, but getting that momentum moving forward, moving into this playoff, I think is big. You know, Sam Mayer has gotten himself into the mix with a couple of wins. You know, Barry has had been close at times. It isn't the same deal as it was last year. Um, obviously, his mind and focus is also looking towards his future, uh, driving a four car in Cup. And then you have you know, Allgaier, the, the veteran. And then they're also trying to get Bruckshot Jones into the playoff here. He needs a win, essentially. Uh, so they were trying to see if they can get everybody in there. Uh, you look at the point situation. Um, eight drivers have wins. I think Jeb Burton is outside of the uh, top 12 overall. Uh, Sammy Smith was 12th. It's uh, right on the cut of the uh, points. But uh, but Burton is Jeb Burton is in. Josh Berry is plus 110 to the cut, so a few points uh, in whether if he does good in the stages at Darlington this weekend, uh, that's basically a lock. Sheldon Creed, if he can get a good good day at uh, Darlington, 
Same for Hemrick. I think they're both of them are pretty decent there. I mean, Creed was close to winning this race last September. So those three guys can be locked into the the playoff with good runs at Darlington. The playoff battle would basically be decided between Parker Kligerman and Riley Herbst. Uh outside of somebody uh within outside of that group of the regulars winning one of those two races which is probably slim and none the truck series had their uh return to the milwaukee mile uh this past weekend and it was it was definitely a race where you had to I think when you have a few guys that actually have experience there, you had a good crowd, it looks like. Um, you talk about, uh, I mean, you have the hometown guy in Ty Majeski who comes in. He's had experience there winning in the uh, ASA Stars National Tour. He's, um, you know, you look at other guys, Crafton, of course, he's been around for 150 years, so, I mean, he's liable to have raced everywhere. He probably raced against Zeus. Um, you'd look at the... But when it came down to it, it was the playoff guys stood out. They were the ones that were able to make uh, things happen, the vast majority of them, that is. Um, Grant Enfinger gets the victory after GMS uh, announces or... Maury Gallagher announces that uh, they're going to close the uh, close the sh- close shop uh, officially at the end of the year. Um, Enfinger takes both stages. He started on pole, takes both stages, leads the most laps. So he got the the um, Grand Slam there at um, the Milwaukee Mile, Milwaukee Mile Speedway. Uh, that's I don't know who called it that, but that's stupid. Uh, that's probably NASCAR. Carson Hosovar started second or started third, finished second. Christian Eckes finished third after starting sixth. Corey Heim eighth to fourth. Crafton twenty second to fifth. Uh, top five all playoff guys. Ty Majeski who had to uh, start tailback with the aforementioned uh, penalty that saw Joe Shear Jr. get uh, sent out of the racetrack from tailback to seventh. Derek Krause, credit to him and the Spire team, 25th to 8th. Jake Garcia, 9th. Uh, Bailey Curry in the 41, 10th. Chase Birdie, first non-playoff guy in 6th. Zane Smith was 12th. Ben Rhodes, 16th. Um, Nick Sanchez started 2nd. Had decent stage points, but ended up falling back to 24th. And Matt D. Burrito had some stage points as well. Or no, he didn't have any stage points out of Sawalich. Uh Started 23rd, finished 27th. He announced that he's not going to be back with uh, the 25 team, and barely anybody cares. Um, the, I mean, I guess the takeaway is you can never count out Grant and Finger, Josh. Uh, I mean, they had, uh, you had, he won an IRP last year to start the playoff after not really being someone that everyone was looking at as a guy who could win races and be a championship contender wins there takes it all the way to phoenix now he goes and wins at the milwaukee mile and, and gives himself uh, momentum as they go to kansas a track that he's run well at over the years and with the issues that ty majeski uh and the thor sport team are looking at right now um, has the momentum shifted now? Is it more of a wide open situation again because of the penalty, or is it just you know will Ty Majeski and company will be able to hold, and they just have to get through the next round? Yeah, that's an interesting scenario there, and you know I think first with uh, Grand Infinger, you know he's something that we don't really think about a whole lot. I mean, unless you know you really follow the truck series, and um, you know a lot of these new guys. Um, that are trying to make it up into the Xfinity and Cup Series, you know, they steal a lot of the attention, you know, like um, Corey Heim or Carson Hosovar, a lot of, you know, a lot of the talk is on them. Um, you know, obviously we know about Matt Crafton, widely veteran, been there a long time, but, you know, we don't really think about um, uh, Grant Infinger a whole lot in this series. And, you know, he's somebody that's kind of been around for a while. He's got, you know, 10 wins now. And, you know, now winning at the Milwaukee Mile, now he's, 
in the round of eight. So yeah, it definitely makes that that battle for the truck series, you know, playoffs definitely a lot more interesting. And you know, with um, you know, with that penalty, I think, you know, Majeski, of course, you know, he. It's gonna be interesting. I think you know he has. Um, I mean, it's big. It's a big issue there. For first of all, I mean, that's like one of the things that you don't do is modify uh, the you know the wheels or uh, whatever. So you know that's definitely um, something that's gonna change the playoffs. I think you know, like you say, he's probably just gonna have to make it to the next round uh, in this playoff. Um, I I think it's gonna be tough for him. Um, you know, after that, um, I think there's going to be maybe increased scrutiny and, you know, if they make it to the final round, uh, of the playoffs, you know, it's, they're going to have a lot, a lot to think about because, um, I think the final round of the playoffs, of course, they have, um, you know, they push the limit really on that car. And if, you know, if they've already been penalized once, um, they're probably going to be looked at a little bit harder, um, by, by NASCAR. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely not not something that you want to see and you know they lost they have 75 points and five playoff points uh that they lost here and it's definitely going to affect his ability to win the championship because once they reset this you know even though even though he's you know already into the next round and everything even though all that's good you know um it's you know the ability to make it to you know the next one is going to be tough because um of, of that penalty he's going to have to win another race to get there so we'll see how that happens and you know, if um, this penalty, you know, takes ability their their ability to win races, that's definitely gonna hurt them. So, you know, I think yeah, make it to the next round if they can. But you know, they've definitely got a, a tough road ahead of them um, if they can't win their way in. So, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see. But you know, Enfinger definitely makes his uh, case for the championship here. So we'll see how he's able to um, you know follow it out into the next round and get to the round of you know the round of four i mean we've already talked about the round of eight here in the truck series doesn't even feel like it for some reason and you know by we're still got like you know we're september 1st today and the championship is the first weekend of november and so we we still got two full calendar months and we're already talking about the round of four here so yeah that's kind of crazy but um yeah grand interfere definitely you know he definitely has a shot you know i think it'll be a good you know, closing goodbye to the GMS truck team as they probably consolidate into focusing in, um, you know, Legacy Motor Club as it's known in the Cup Series for their Cup efforts. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely something that um, you know we're have to think about with that team. Yeah, and you know, you look at what you can't that holy trinity in NASCAR. You can't mess with those things. It it could be the thing that bands that team together. Uh Ty Majeski has been has had a great year <clears throat> both in the truck but also in his super late model winning races. And he is known as a great, you know, super late model racer, period. He is an employee at Thor Sport Racing as well. So it could be the uniting force that they're able to use it as a motivation, even though it was a big time uh rules infraction and that could bring them together and be the momentum they need against the likes of a Corey Heim or uh, Carson Hosevar because uh, Carson Hosevar has been pretty outspoken about it or I mean I would have said Zane Smith but I think the stuff that's been going on with uh, him in front row and the Fords is not very good so it doesn't look like that momentum is there for the defending series champion, Craftsman Truck Series champion. So right now, um, Zane Smith has the Zane Smith one, or I mean, Ty Majeski won uh, the the race at IRP, as I mentioned. Brandon Finger wins at uh, the Milwaukee Mile, and they're both locked in to the round of eight. Corey Heim leads the points by nine over Christian Eckes. Uh, end finger Carson Osovar in fourth, Majeski fifth. Then there's a huge gap between Majeski and Zane Smith from fifth and sixth. Matt Crafton, Nick Sanchez, uh, round out the top eight. Sanchez is up plus three on Ben Rhodes and plus 20 on D Burrito. Uh, so Rhodes is that's the battle. Sanchez, who's shown really well 
on the intermediate tracks this year, uh, battling with uh, Ben Rhodes, a former series champion. That also puts, I think that also puts Matt Crafton in the crosshairs as well, because he's only nine points ahead of uh, his teammate. So that'll be the uh, battle for the the last spots in the next round in a couple weeks' time. I'd also, we have to look at what the 38 team continues to do because that momentum is gone and Zane Smith doesn't know what he's doing. We don't know what they're doing with that or with that team. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot of moving parts there at, that's losing. You're losing a big contender uh, if they're basically going to separate after this season. Uh, okay, let's move forward. Uh, but let's move into the uh, Kurt Busch deal. Uh, he announced it on Friday, uh, last Friday, so a week ago now, and he did it on social media. Then he did a presser at Daytona, emotional presser. Kurt Busch uh, came onto the scene in the late 90s, taking over for Chris Trickle in the Star Nursery um, late model in the Southwest Tour and uh, won, won Rookie of the Year and stuff. Uh, and that was a big-time ride. And during that time, he also was called to do one of the Roush gong shows was as they were called back in the day and he was chosen out of that group and he was picked to drive the number 99 xi batteries for in the craftsman truck series his first race uh was marred with contact with his teammate craig piffle uh and also being a part of the crash that almost killed jeff bodine um one of the most famous horrific crashes in NASCAR history. Uh, the, you know, Kurt ended up going and running truck series, finishing like third in points or second in points or whatever. It was a dominating, dominant year for Roush that year in the truck series. Uh, moved to the Cup Series soon after in 2001. Got flipped off by Dale Earnhardt in the Daytona 500. Uh, one of the last things he did. Um, Kurt was uh, rough around the edges for a long time. Uh, got his ass kicked by Jimmy Spencer. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff that went on with Kurt, but as the years went on, he recognized the faults he had and started to turn around, be much better with the fans, and people started to like him and root for him. Uh, I think also the notion that his brother is a bigger douche probably helped. Um, that he was a more prolific winner and all that, but Kurt was able to win in all three major series. He's a Cup Series champion. He went to 2311 and was able to win them their first race. Uh, he continues to work for 2311. I think if you know you look at the CW with their Xfinity package that'll be coming in 2025, they would be it'd be hard pressed to not go and call Kurt Busch and see if he wanted to be a part of their broadcast team because he brings a great insight and he, he did a good job for the truck series it's much better than listening to michael waltrip and um you know phil parsons is long in the tooth at this point uh you know you want to have somebody who's got re relevant knowledge or has an understanding of the vehicles and kurt bush does um he was misunderstood as a driver and i think as a person and there's definitely been a lot of that, <laughs> things that have went on in his career and on and off the track that make him an interesting character. But long story short, he was a damn good race car driver. Um, he wouldn't have been hired by, uh, what is it, three major organizations in his career. If that he hadn't moved three of the biggest organizations, or four of them actually, if we're, to be honest. If he wasn't that good, or five, actually, I keep on adding him, because he drove for Roush, drove for Penske, drove for Stuart Haas, um, then um, that was three, and then he drove for uh, Ganassi, and then uh, 2311. Uh, Josh, what did you think about, I mean, we talked about it offline and stuff, but uh, it's uh, sad news It kind of brings into uh, brings into light again. 
the safety issues that come with the next gen car. It also speaks to uh, how concussions were treated back in the day, 23 years ago, when Kurt became a big three NASCAR driver relative to today. Um, in that, you know, he probably had accidents in in his in a cup car or truck hitting a regular concrete wall and uh, may have been you know knocked knocked uh, out a little bit or may have been had some issues but didn't say anything and that was the way it was but those things multiply and we see that in football and now in Kurt's case he's unable to get back into a race car and it's been over a year since the incident yeah i mean it's definitely a sad situation with kurt bush and um how his career in nascar has ended now and i mean for me i mean i honestly didn't find out about it him actually retiring until literally when he walked out onto the stage for driver intros um because he was the first driver that walked out because they were honoring him and everything and um i hadn't seen it on friday um i was busy um you know throughout the day at work and then doing stuff after work I hadn't really had time to check twitter or anything and then you know throughout the day saturday um not really online or anything like that to be able to see that news and so i literally didn't find out about his re retirement announcement from nascar until he walked across the stage there and everything but um you know for the announcement i mean honestly it's it's not too surprising to hear it um he's already been out of the car uh for a while but um yeah i think it's still you know still sad to see that you know he was able to walk out of the car on his terms you know that the last time he's maybe ever going to drive a race car um is spinning out into the turn four or turn three wall at pocono and qualifying um, you know, Dale Jr. is my driver, and of course, he had his issues with concussions, but, you know, at least can be thankful that, you know, he's still able to race somewhat, you know, he's able to have his final season and have the, you know, retirement tour and everything uh, like that, and he, you know, can race occasionally, and of course, even went and raced uh, earlier at Florence uh, Motor Speedway in South Carolina in late models, so, um, you know, for for Kurt, you know, we don't even know if he's going to be able to do that. It's already been a year. He hasn't done anything, any anything racing wise. And, you know, I think the NASCAR thing is clearly over now. Um, could it be possible for him to try other deals? You know, if he can get more time, uh, you know, to recover and everything. But um, it's really hard to say because, you know, just whatever, whatever issue is preventing him from getting into uh, the car getting back into it seems like there's an issue with his heart rate or something with i guess maybe how his brain is processing that or something like that with get getting it getting too too high or something for um something affecting it by the concussion but um is what the, i think what the doctors were focusing on and then you know also he mentioned that he's starting to develop arthritis and he says that he sometimes has issues with gout uh and makes it painful to walk and all that stuff so um yeah it's something else i have to consider uh, if he tries like if he let's say he does get cleared you know those those uh physical issues can be a little bit um you know make it a little bit harder to get back into a race car you know obviously so that's something to to consider as well so um yeah definitely definitely sad to see him see him go like that um, you know, honestly kind of thought maybe there was hope that he could still get back in there, but, you know, now I guess he's going to transition fully into, you know, being that coach driver, uh, I think they called it certified or, um, CF, CFO chief, chief fun officer or something like that at 2311 racing, um, uh, and help Bubba Wallace help, uh, Tyler Reddick as they go on 20, you know, 2023 playoffs and try to make a run for the title. We'll see if it happens, but, um, I guess, yeah, I, I think for, for me, you know, I grew more appreciative of him as, you know, he went through that deal where he, he went to the 51, became known as the outlaw, you know, brought the 78, some credibility there and, you know, brought a car that never made the chase, you know, into the chase, even though they didn't win a race. And then of course, you know, going and doing the double in the Indianapolis 500 and finishing in sixth place with, uh, Andretti Autosport and didn't finish the 600, but still, you know, it's a pretty admirable effort, um, 
you know, considering how tough it is in both those races and everything. And, you know, so I think from, from then, you know, I've always had kind of a, you know, admiration for him. And, you know, I think over the years, he's kind of become a student of the sport and everything. So, um, you know, definitely going to miss his presence on the racetrack now that that's completely, that door has been completely closed. So, um, you know, um, I've always enjoyed his approach to racing. You know, I've said before, he's a very cerebral driver. You know, he understands, you know, the, the race car and understands the track. You know, he's a very smart guy, obviously. And, um, you know, went, went to the university of Arizona for, I think a semester or two to study pharmacology or something like that. So clearly, you know, he, um, has the capability to, um, you know, put himself in situations where, um, he has to use, you know, his intellect, uh, to get the most out of his race car and, um, you know, use, use that, um, intelligence, sorry, intelligence to, you know, get, um, in certain situations and be able to handle himself. So, um, yeah, definitely going to miss him and, you know, it's sad, sad that it ends like this, but, um, maybe, maybe because of it, you know, if this doesn't happen, you know, maybe we don't have the focus and scrutiny on the next gen car. Obviously we saw Ryan Blaney, Ryan Priest both have, pretty hard incidents on Saturday night. So, and obviously the increased focus on concussions since then, you know, I think because of, because of his incident, now they've kind of begun to focus in on the flaws of this car finally. And now, you know, maybe if it weren't for that incident, we'd be talking about Ryan Blaney being out for a race with, with that concussion or Ryan Priest potentially being out with a concussion. So, um, you know, progress m being made since then slowly, but, you know, um, seems like maybe we're tracking the right direction, but, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the safety of these cars and Kurt came in at a time when safety was probably at its worst. Worst, uh, He was in the truck series in the year 2000. And in NASCAR's Big Three Series, three drivers passed away. Um, he ended up being in the Daytona 500 that we all know what happened at the end in 2001. Uh, the changes they made over the years after that uh, pushed a lot by Indianapolis with the safer barrier. Um, Hans device, which was Jim Downing, and um, I forget who his co his partner was on that. Uh you know, the kind of things that they had to do to make the car safer and more uh, um, uh, reliable in terms of being able to keep the drivers in a good place and be able to keep on going. Uh, I think even like Dale Jr.'s situation could have definitely been a lot more different. Uh, I always remember his California wreck uh, back in 02, and I think that was the one that started the downward trend uh for his you know the concussions and stuff but the hits that those guys took back in the day uh we never looked at in, into them and there wasn't even with the great journals of the time they weren't digging and looking at it in that sense they were just asking him, oh are you okay they're gonna say yeah they're not gonna go and say oh no i have i'm dizzy or i can't see you right now my vision is blurry uh I look at Kurt's situation, and, and I, there's a in a parallel to a point of Ernie, Ernie Irvin, but Ernie Irvin, of course, almost died uh, at Michigan International Speedway in 1994 after a failed uh, right rear, right front tire failed, and um, had a 10% chance to live. Basically, lost the sight in his left eye. It took over a year to recover got back in a race car and was competitive definitely but wasn't the same guy and but made himself way more uh susceptible after that incident to any type of massive hit uh ended up uh getting through the 96 season finishing 10th in points basically with one eye i always like to say that i'm like look at all those guys out there that had two functional eyes and he basically had one and he beat all of them uh, and if they actually had an equal balance at Robert Yates Racing, he could have probably done even more and won two races. But in 97, uh, competitiveness started to go away. 98, he was still around. He still had some pace, but he wasn't in the same type of equipment. Kurt, uh, fortunately, outside of 
that one year with the uh, Phoenix Racing when he basically napalmed himself out of Penske was in competitive equipment and he was able to win races and he was able to make a difference and be a kind of a mentor at the end of his career, which would have never been something people would have thought about him back in 2000. Uh, it's a shame. It sucks. Um, you want to, like Josh said, you want to be able to leave on your own terms. But like I'm talking about with Ernie, he hit the wall. He had accidents in 90, uh, 98 and 99 that um, knocked him out. And then eventually in a Bush Series accident at Michigan International Speedway, the career-ending crash uh, that he had to call the editor to announce his retirement at this weekend at the Darlington Southern 500 with his kids who were very little at the time and his wife. And so it's not ideal. It's the same kind of thing with Dale Jr. He knew that if he kept on going that he was more likely to end up being in a bad situation and with his team, but also his wife, and knowing that he has two young daughters, he had to make that decision. But he was able to race one more year. You know, Ernie wasn't able to do that, and Kurt's not able to do that. But at least Kurt is here. And I think that is the positive that we can take, hopefully, with the recovery measures that he's doing, some of the other ailments that are coming with it. He, he'll be able to have a good life and also stay in motorsport. I think that's all that we can really hope for for Kurt and for his family. I'm going to change it to a different note. We'll take it to a more um, positive uh, note and talk about the Bomberito Automotive Group 500K at uh, Worldwide Technology Raceway, Gateway, and Scott Dixon. So, I mean, how he did what he did, only m made the race on three pit stops, while most everybody else had to make the next, what is it, three, four, five, six, seven, eight guys had to make five pit stops. Two less pit stops, led 123 laps. Uh, the race was basically between him and Joseph Newgarden, Newgarden hitting the fence late in the race, knocking himself out of contention, and in the process probably putting himself out of reach for the uh, championship uh because he's oh he's now what is it 125 points behind with uh yeah basically yeah he's he's fucked um he, uh, yeah it's 125 now with two races to go even if he scored the maximum amount of points it would be 106 so yeah he's done and uh he's in the crosshairs now with Pat O'Ward and Scott McLaughlin but Scott Dixon has now won two races in a row his teammate, Alex Palou, ended up finishing 7th. Uh, Dixon came from 16th to win at Gateway uh, over Pato Award, David Malukas, and Alexander Rossi, Scott McLaughlin rounding out the top five. Herda, Palou, Rosenquist, Will Power, Marcus Erickson rounding out the top 10. Uh, I mentioned uh, New Garden leading 98 laps. And then the rest outside of that, there's... 18 for Award, 13 for Herta, 4 for Rossi, and 4 for Power. Power and McLaughlin uh, had issues, of course, together in practice. Uh, Power was pissed off. Then McLaughlin was pissed off with David Malukas and his uh, driving. Malukas gets a second podium in a, a second year in a row at uh, Gateway, uh, knowing and sandwiched between two guys that he may be working with next year in award and rossi but the story is scott dixon uh i mean can it, it I, we can't ever put question what scott dixon could do josh i come from 16 to win make two less pit stops than every other car in the field he's a he's a goat for a reason uh, that's that's all i can say i mean he's now he still has a chance i mean albeit very small but he has a chance if he can put together two great weekends uh, at Portland this weekend and Laguna Seca next weekend, and he could possibly get that seventh championship. But it's going to be hard work, and he might have to win out to do it. But he's already won two races in a row, so what's stopping him from getting four, right? Yeah, I mean, it would be Scott Dixon like to be able to go out and steal a championship at the last minute from uh, Alex Pelot. You know, we've seen... Um, 
him do it before and everything, you know, look go back to 2015 when you know, he came down to the final race to steal it from Juan Pablo Montoya there when, you know, Montoya's first, second year back from IndyCar and he goes out and wins or loses in the final race to Scott Dixon. But, um, you know, Scott Dixon, I mean, this race was Joseph Newgarden's race and then, you know, out of nowhere, um, Willpower, or, sorry, not Willpower, but, um, I was reading his name there on results, but Scott Dixon comes out there and goes out and wins this race. And yeah, I mean, taking two less pit stops is phenomenal, especially, um, you know, a place like Gateway, uh, an oval track, nonetheless, um, you know, um, that's quite a feat to be able to do that, um, and everything. So, you know, um, Scott Dixon goes out there and, you know, wins, wins this race. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really surprising. Honestly, didn't think it would happen. You know, I really, really thought that, you know, Newgarden would go out here and just take care of business and, you know, sweep all the ovals this year. But then, you know, that doesn't happen. Um, he goes out and brushes the wall and takes himself out there. And um, now he has, uh, you know, not going to win the championship, of course. And I put a bet on him at the beginning of the year for Newgarden to win the championship. And that's not going to happen or anything, but whatever, you know, that's fine. Uh, and all that, but, you know, Scott Dixon, you know, it's just a very Scott Dixon-like moment there to go out and be able to do that. I mean, obviously, credit to the crew, but, you know, also for him, um, you know, he he's a, he's like the one driver that's really able to get the most out of this car, and, you know, suddenly for, you know, Alex Pelot, I mean, looks looks like, um, you know, Alex Pelot still has a likely chance to win the championship, but, you know, his teammate, knocking on the door just ever so slightly saying not so fast. So, um, you know, I think for, for Pelot, you know, I think he's just got to come out of Portland here and then go into Laguna Seca when making no mistakes. And, you know, he obviously doesn't need to win, but, you know, he can't go out there and, um, have like a below top 10 day, I would say, uh, or, you know, crash out or something like that. I mean, obviously part, you know, failures can happen and all that stuff, but, um, that's out of your hands at that point. So, you know, Alex, Alex blows, um, wouldn't say he's nervous or anything like that, but you know, definitely got to, got to keep that on watch. Um, cause you know, Scott Dixon definitely not going away here, um, before the end of the season, you know, with only even two races left. So, um, yeah, I mean the racing yeah, is definitely good and everything. Of course, um, relatively incident free, of course, you know, the lap one incident, Ben Peterson, and then later on, uh, in this race, you know, had a, another yellow with, um, uh, with Takuma Sato there, um, making contact. So in, in turn two, so, um, yeah, that was, um, pretty interesting there. And then of course, you know, Newgarden getting into it as well. So, um, yeah, disappointing there for him for, you know, Newgarden starting on pole and then, you know, leading 98 laps and everything and looking like he would probably continue to win, but no, that doesn't happen. Scott Dixon just out, out does the field and everything. So, um, yeah, that was pretty interesting there. Um, you know, obviously award finishing second as well. So led led a little bit of laps as well, and then um, Colton Herta led some laps as well. So um, yeah, definitely a very interesting race strategy wise. So um, yeah, now I'm looking forward to seeing how these last two races play out. You know, is Scott Dixon just gonna pull it out of that here, or is you know Alex Blow gonna go ahead and lock up this title? We'll see. And Alex Polo now has to work really hard. Uh, I don't know. I, he definitely hasn't been coasting. Uh, the notion that they're away from the ovals is in his favor. He's never really been fond of the ovals. He's gotten better, of course, but uh, that seems to be, that's kind of that weakness, if there is a weakness in, in Polo's game. But Dixon can race anywhere, win every anywhere. Uh, he can do anything really. Um, I mean, that's, it's just insane, uh, what Scott Dixon can do. So he just has to go out there and I guess keep on going with it because it would make an intriguing Laguna Seca finale. If he can cut, cut the, he needs to cut another, he's right now 74 points behind. He would have to cut 21 points more into the gap. Uh, this weekend uh, to to make it you know mathematically possible or maybe a little less than that but because of qualifying points and all but 
essentially he needs to cut it down twenty between twenty to twenty five points uh to make it a a battle going into Laguna Seca next week um here at Portland. We'll talk about Portland in a little while. Uh Formula One was at the uh at Zanfort for the Dutch Grand Prix. Um you know who won. There was weather early in the race. It was they had rain basically right at the start. Certain teams responded to said rain much better than others. Uh some guys ended up basically having egg on their face. Uh, with uh, with how things were handled, um, I mean it was kind of a a cluster really uh, of a race. But um, Fish Lips ended up getting a third consecutive win at his one of his home tracks. Um, Fernando Alonso and Pierre Gasly rounded out the podium. Uh, was a closer uh, finish mainly because of the weather. Uh, Alonso 3.7 four seconds behind Pierre Gasly just over seven seconds Sergio Perez 10 seconds back and forth and Carlos Sainz in fifth Lewis Hamilton Lando Norris Alexander Albon Oscar Piastri and Esteban Ocon getting uh, points for Aston or I mean for Alpine so Alpine gets double points McLaren gets double points uh, this and also Red Bull Liam Lawson in his Formula One debut uh, in subs- as a substitute for Daniel Ricciardo broke his ha- right hand in practice earlier in the weekend, finished 13th. Uh, Logan Sargent fell out of the race early while he was in position. He had a chance possibly to get those elusive points, uh, fell out. He had crashed in qualifying after making it into the Q3 for the first time. Leclerc... Uh, Incident for him and so for Guan Yu Zhou as well. Uh, George Russell finished dead last of the classified runners in 17th. I mean, I'll I'll say, you know, for we knew that what was going to happen, we both picked him to win, but Fernando Alonso for the first time in a while uh, coming up there, finishing on the podium. And I thought that he was somebody to look at. Um, I picked him to finish third uh, in the race. We both picked New Garden to win a gateway, and it definitely didn't work. All uh, the, the only pick that was somewhat good was your pick of Malukas. We both picked Fish Lips. Our second place finishes wasn't there, and Alonzo I got in third. Uh, nobody saw Pierre Gasly doing what he did. I think that's what essentially it shows that rain and handling. St- calling strategy the right way in mixed conditions can make such a difference even if your car is not good you can go and make it up because the rain is more of an equalizer outside of the guy who has a rocket ship and could go and go and get uh go for a fast food break go and take a shit and still come back and he could win the race anyways but um what what were your thoughts on uh, the dutch grand prix this past weekend I mean, yeah, it's another Max Verstappen benefit race, like you say, as always. But, um, you know, for Verstappen, you know, he says that, you know, his most stressful win of all the nine wins that he won, which might be true in the sense of, I guess, the weather and how that behaved. And, um, you know, the weather happened a lot sooner than what people thought it was. It sounds like Florida in a way with rain just suddenly happening out of nowhere. But, um, you know, um, this... Dutch Grand Prix, of course, uh, I mean, I don't think it was really an issue for Ristop, and of course, you know, he dropped a little bit to the 11th, but, you know, it's how it goes when strategy comes into play, especially with, you know, the unknowns of racing in the rain and pitting for intermediate tires, and um, there's all that in factor, but, you know, Verstappen, um, he's able to pull it out as always, so, I mean, it's not really a question whether he'd actually win, um, but, you know, I think for Alonso, you know, coming out there and and having a good weekend, you know, is definitely a um, surprise. We haven't seen him on the podium for a bit. Started out the season, you know, have grabbing a couple of podiums, but now, you know, this last race here in 
uh, Zanfort finally getting a podium again, so kind of back onto the radar. And then, you know, of course, you talk about uh, Pierre Gasly. I mean, moved from, uh, you know, from Tor or from Alpha Tori and, you know, goes goes over um, to Alpine and, you know, really haven't heard from him. So, you know, surprising to see him come out and get out into the podium. But, you know, I think, you know, this probably benefited from, you know, this, you know, different strategy and the rain and everything. So, um, yeah, I mean, not really a whole lot to talk about here in this race other than, you know, the rain happening. Um, so that did kind of make it interesting. So, um, I guess it's the only time it really gets interesting when Max Verstappen is dominant is if the rain happens and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, after that, uh, you know, Verstappen gets back in control of this race and, you know, ends up winning. So yeah, nothing, you know, nothing, um, really to talk about other than that, but yeah, once again, Verstappen wins. Yeah, and it's but I uh, we can look at this race. I mean, coming up at the Italian Grand Prix, that could also be uh, an equalizer because of the low downforce setup, and you know, some teams taking chances with their cars relative to what Max is because he's trying to get the World Championship and the Constructors' Championship uh, sewed up uh, would be his second legitimate uh, championship. And if he were to do it, he'll go and preview the Italian Grand Prix in a little bit. Uh, move on to the GSP roundup uh, here for this week, and I'll mention the points in a, when we talk about the Italian Grand Prix. Oh, no, actually, we're going to talk fantasy football and preseason thoughts or closing thoughts. Um, I'll let you go first, Josh. Uh, uh, what, are your, what are you looking at with the preseason over and leading into the regular season starting more than a week from now? But we're, we're ready to go. Jacksonville is a, a team on the rise and a team that a lot of people are looking at in a crowded AFC that could be a, a dark horse uh, coming into the 2023 season with such a young, talented roster. Yeah, and, you know, I think for me personally, you know, now that preseason's over, now I can focus in on the regular season. Um, you know, it's been interesting preseason and everything, um, you know, with the Jags, you know, opening up first pass for Trevor Lawrence interception, you know, going, doing that, but then finishing out with those, some solid drives, uh, in the last preseason game against the Dolphins. Um, the Dolphins game is kind of interesting there. I mean, you know, we had, had some good runs with Tank Bigsby, of course. And, um, I think that's probably, probably one of the takeaways I have is, um, just seeing what we have, um, behind Travis Etienne there. And then, you know, also Calvin Ridley had a good highlight catch, catching one that I think people initially ruled as uh, out of bounds there. So, you know, definitely I think it's going to be interesting with Calvin Ridley coming into this offense, going to make this, uh, you know, team on offense very interesting. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, if you're a fantasy player, I think, I mean, I didn't get Calvin Ridley. I mean, I already doubled, can't have three Jags players, I think, but, um, you know, Travis Etienne, Trevor Lawrence, um, Calvin Ridley, I think are going to have good seasons. going to make them not only contenders to win the AFC South, which I think, you know, that's definitely a lock right now. Um, but I think also, you know, for a deep playoff run. And, I mean, I expect the Jaguars to make it to the AFC Championship game. That's that's really, I think, the standard. Um, I'm not going to say Super Bowl yet. Uh, we'll see how they do during the regular season. But... Uh, I definitely expect them to be there, uh, you know, in at the end of January, competing for the Lamar Hunt Trophy, you know, going out and seeing who, if, you know, they make it into the Super Bowl. So that's, um, I think that's got to be, as a fan, my expectation there um, right now. And we'll see how that goes. Uh, you know, defensively, still a bit of a question there. Um, interior defensive line early on is going to be a little bit banged up. I've already been banged up some during training camp. Uh, in preseason, uh, Davin Hamilton out for the first four games of the season on injured reserve currently for a uh, non-football related back injury, uh, which I don't know how that happened, but um, um, it's a little bit of a downer there. Um, so, you know, that's, of course, uh, an issue, um, you know, 
got some issues with pass rush. I mean, with who who they're keeping and everything. Um, um, you know, I think Josh Allen, Trayvon Walker, got to step it up uh, this season and and you know make make it interesting. You know, you got um, Foley Fodakowski who's you know been dinged up as well. So um, you know, defensively, I think if they can if they can produce constantly on the pass rush, definitely help the offense. You know, be able to put away games and all that stuff. So um, yeah, looking forward to it and everything. You know, of course, uh, we got the Colts coming up here. Um, you know, finally been looking forward to it for, you know, many months now, but, you know, finally first game of the regular season's on next Sunday. Uh, so looking forward to them playing against the Colts. And then of course, um, you know, you got the chiefs, uh, coming up here uh, on week two. Uh, so that's gonna be kind of interesting. It's almost, you know, going back to, you know, 2017, 2018, you know, the Jags, you know, lost late to the Patriots in the AFC Championship game, and then they came out and won in their home opener against the play uh, the Patriots and what we thought was going to be their revenge game and preview of what was to come. You know, back then it ended up not happening, but you know, with Blake Bortles and everything, and um, you know, now it's kind of kind of a similar vibe here. You know, the Jags lost to uh, the Chiefs in the playoffs, a close you know close loss and everything, and what was a close game, and you know, one that they had a chance to win. And now week two, uh, they're going to be playing the Chiefs. So uh, if they can come out and, you know, beat the Chiefs at home, I think it's going to be a huge, huge statement win for, for them. Definitely put the entire league on notice and what they're able to do. So definitely looking for, you know, looking forward to watching that game and seeing, you know, how it all plays out. And speaking of Bortles, saw this tweet that now after being retired from the NFL, um, now he's uh, – bored and trying to build his house and he's joined the construction crew in building his house in Florida, wherever that is. So kind of interesting, you know, back in the day, he said if he weren't playing football, he'd be working construction and ripping cigs. So I guess he's living the dream now and it all comes full circle. So, um, yeah, kind of interesting how that all plays out. But, you know, as far as, you know, the actual Jaguars, you know, maybe this time, you know, they'll follow through on their expectations after the last time they made the playoffs. So, uh, unlike they did last time. So, yeah, definitely looking in, you know, forward to it. And, of course, fantasy-wise, I mean, you know, we've already talked about our, you know, lineups, you know, from our draft a couple weeks ago. So, you know, definitely looking forward to playing uh, again this year and looking to, you know, try to bring home the championship belt or whatever the title is. So, yeah, definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, it's a championship belt. You get a ring with it as well. Um, so if you if you're able to win it this year, I'm hoping to actually win it for the first time in I don't know, I think nine years, I think is the unfortunately. But um I hope to get there. Uh for the 49ers, a lot of the preseason was more to do with the two major stories that existed one with the quarterback battle and one with the ongoing contract uh, situation with the de- defensive player of the year, Nick Bosa. Uh, the Bosa deal has still not happened. They're $4 million uh, apart uh, based on what the Niners are offering relative to what Nick Bosa wants. I think he looks at his career and he looks at some of the injuries he's had and wanting guarantees, looking at his brother as well, and his history, he also wants to be the highest paid player, defensive player in the NFL, um, being in that range with, uh, um, why am I forgetting uh, the L.A. Uh, Rams guy? Uh, what the hell is his name? The defensive tackle. Uh, Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald, yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, there's that. But you also look at the fact that when Nick Bosa is on the field, the 49ers defense is at a different level. When he hasn't been on the field, they have not been as good of a defense, even though they have been high, uh, top uh, top defense. They haven't been the best. Uh, that is something that with, you know, nine days to go till you know, you get to... We get to opening nine days till they play against the Pittsburgh Steelers at uh, whatever the fuck they call what used to be Heinz Field. Um, it's something that we have to look at and is concerning. Now, the other piece, I mean, there is, we lost Ray Ray McLeod for a little while. So the punt and kick return 
uh, situations kind of, you know, going to be in flux to kicking situation or his injuries to both rookie Jake Moody and uh, um, Zane Gonzalez, the veteran. Uh, they had the idea they wanted to trade Zane Gonzalez and get some draft capital, but he got hurt. Moody got hurt. Rumors about trying to get Robbie Gould back, but Gould wants a full season guarantee um, after all these years of playing. And it doesn't, it would be a short term rental, if anything. I think the Niners want to see what Moody can do. He has a big leg. They spent their first pick in the draft this past April on him. So uh, that's something that we have to look at. I mean, they're able to kind of keep a lot of the players, some of the key uh, contributors that, you know, didn't leave in free agency, keep guys like T.Y. McGill on the practice squad, somebody who made a lot of big plays late in the year and also in the postseason. Um, the offensive line, you have to look at the right side and um, how they're going to continue to grow uh, while you have the best offensive lineman in the game. Uh, in Trent Williams, how many more years can he go? Uh, being that pillar uh, on the left side, you have Christian McCaffrey. You have an offense that is going to be a dynamic offense as long as Brock Purdy is upright. Uh, CMC, Brandon Ayuk, uh, Debo Samuel, or Debo Samuels, if you are some of these other people, call say his name, George Kittle, and uh, who's had a great, they had a great uh, chemistry with, with the Purdy, so I think he could have, be that dual threat that he was years ago uh, when he came onto the scene, uh, getting great pass catching numbers while working on and becoming probably the best blocking tight end in the NFL too. Uh, the offense is pretty good right now. The defense we know has got elite players, the linebackers and stuff with Warner and um, Greenlaw. You got uh, other players. You got Armstead in the interior and they also have Javon Hargrave who they paid a lot of money for from Philadelphia to solidify the inside. Uh, they're waiting on Bosa. They've got Cleveland Farrell, who was a former top five draft pick for the Raiders. Uh, didn't work out there, but it looks like in this system with the, what the hell is his name? Uh, uh, not Wilkes. Uh, it's um, the defensive coordinator. A defensive coordinator, new defensive coordinator for 49ers. Um the um you know the list uh, yeah so the I'm looking at yeah there you go it is Chris Fors yeah Steve Wilkes it is Steve Wilkes oh okay I thought it was somebody else okay so I was right um yeah Steve Wilkes' system he's a big secondary guy which I think is going to be good for the Niners because of the youth they have in the cornerback room and uh, you know there's a lot of changes back there but. Hafunga, elite safety, uh, somebody that is going to keep on getting better. He's that leader on the back end, uh, working with those corners. You have Lenore and you have um, Mooney Ward back there as well. But um, the one piece that I have to go and get off my chest uh, is the Trey Lance situation. And... I have friends that are 49er fans. I have people that we're in this league with that are 49er fans uh, in Luke. And he was never a Trey Lance guy. I was. Um, I remember being at the bar with uh, one of my friends who is also in the league and sitting there on the edge of my seat waiting for who the Niners were going to pick at three overall. If they had picked Mac Jones, I was not going to be a 49er fan anymore. Um, if they picked Justin Fields, I was, you know, I was going to be okay with it. And um, they probably should have picked Justin Fields, honestly. But um, they um, picked Trey Lance. And Trey Lance, they were hitching the wagon to him. Uh, they were going to have him learn under Jimmy Garoppolo that first year. They literally brought him in in the first series of the season. He ran in for a touchdown, uh, got hurt. You know, 
you know, extending the football, hurt his finger and effed him up the whole year. And uh, he had another, you know, lingering injury that took place. But he played, he had two starts, one bad start and one good one. And uh, by the end of 21, they had made the NFC Championship game or they, I, whatever they're, they were, they were in the mix to, to um, contend, but they decided after that year that Garoppolo wasn't going to be the guy. Uh, they were going to go to Trey. They had given the keys to him to a start in a, in, I don't know how many minutes into the first quarter or whatever it was. Uh, Kyle Shanahan in his infinite wisdom used him like RG3, ran him into the line and he fractures his leg and ankle and he's done and um they didn't really use him to the strengths that he had he wasn't a running quarterback he could scramble and he could make plays with his legs but he wasn't a running quarterback um yes his release was not was slower than it has but it was right here um over these last few weeks he worked on that he always worked hard and he was a team guy. People liked him. He was well liked in the locker room. It wasn't he wasn't a bad person. Uh, if he was a bad, if he was a cancer, then I get what's going on. Um, Shanahan and Lynch decided to sign Sam Darnold first day of the off the first day of free agency, and essentially that was the day that they had decided that they were not going to um, have Trey Lance. Uh, be a part of the organization anymore they just hadn't told trey or um a lot of the other people on the roster uh they said that there was a battle but there really wasn't a battle trey had a rough uh preseason opener against the raiders darnold was okay i guess but he wasn't spectacular in his performance against the raiders and at that one game uh, along with whatever I probably had decided anyway, they decided that they were going to go on with Sam Darnold. They said that Trey Lance had a chance still, but they played Sam Darnold for three quarters of the second preseason game, and uh, they put Lance in in basically garbage in garbage duty. They played better, uh, but you know in the end it wasn't enough, and somehow or another. Of all the people that they decide to trade, a guy who they spent three ones and a three four, they trade him to the fucking Dallas Cowboys. I mean, come on, it's 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 bad enough that you you royally fuck this guy over, you royally fuck this pickup, and in the in the world in the in the annals of history in drafts, not when you whiff on a draft pick that high on a quarterback that's usually a a franchise killer the 49ers have somehow or another with this regime shielded themselves from that because they got brock purdy at 250 whatever you know and he was dude they were they were already saying that they were happy with him being the backup guy last year coming out of camp while they were treating jimmy garoppolo like he was a spare part uh, once, once Trey Lance's right leg was fucked, all of a sudden, hey, uh, Jimmy, can you play? And he did. He played all right. He played the best that I think he actually ever played for the 49ers, um, except for periods of that 19 season when, of course, they went to the Super Bowl. He was a throw away from being the Super Bowl MVP and winning the game. Um, but they really did. They did Trey Lance dirty. They did. It was like, organizational negligence in the way that they went about this pick and how they treated him and how they handled it it was pathetic um in the media and the leaks and all that stuff trey lance was not a bad you know i mean was he the right guy is he is he an elite quarterback we will we may never know but when you spent that many draft picks and the miami dolphins have got four starters off of off of that deal uh, because they traded all those damn draft picks. The Philadelphia Eagles have benefited from that trade. And then also, I'm I'm trying to remember, there's one other team. Oh, yeah, the Cowgirls. They got Micah Parsons. So they've literally helped three franchises set themselves up with elite players. They then quit 
on their number three draft pick and never truly, honestly give him a chance. They're hitching their wagon to a guy who was Mr. Irrelevant, who had a good half a season, kind of. It had it has vibes of what Jimmy did for five games uh, in 2017 when they were, what, 0-11 and, 11 and uh, were going to get the number one draft pick. He wins five games in a row to end the season, um, and they break him off the big contract. It's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the 49ers have been... They were a laughing stock of a franchise for the better part of this century. They had the period for three or four years with Harbaugh. Um, then they fucked him over. Then the Shanahan Lynch regime came in. They've had ups and downs, a lot of a lot of injuries to key players. And uh, Trey Lance was not, none the was one of them. But it to me, it's coaching. And organizational negligence. If Kyle Shanahan is supposed to be a quarterback guru and a guy who can develop players, then you shouldn't have to have people who are just robots playing your system. You should be able to take an athlete, somebody who has a good arm but needs refinement, and work on those tools, but also look at what skill set he has and build a system around him. Not say, no, you have to do everything that I say, period. A good coach is able to make their system work for whoever they have. Kyle Shanahan has proven over I don't know how many places he's been that if he's not able to implement his system the way he wants to and have the kind of players that fit that, he'll end up quitting or it'll end up not working. He had Jimmy Garoppolo for all these years. The guy, when he was upright, more or less was pretty solid, but he couldn't stay upright. And... uh Trey four fucking starts or whatever in his career for a number three overall draft pick and they dump him for a fourth to the cowgirls and then they're taking Sam Darnold as their backup who has been a who's also been a bum and a who's been a bust uh, uh failed in with the Jets and they'll say well that was Adam Gase that's completely honest you can say that 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 has relevancy. We went to Carolina, and he's, he was mediocre. Uh, but he's like, oh, he can make the throws, and he can make the reads, and all this. Look, here's the reality. If Brock Purdy gets hurt, the 49ers are fucked. It's basically what this has been ever since they've came in. Kyle Shanahan thought that he would take Brian Hoyer and be a starter, and they were 0-10. They had to trade for Jimmy Garoppolo, and they somehow or another were able to. Garoppolo had two season-ending injuries in three years. The one year he didn't, or one year he doesn't, he goes, they go to the Super Bowl and should have won. Uh, they use all that capital for Trey Lance. He gets hurt basically in the first game he plays and dealt with those injuries the whole time. He doesn't utilize Trey Lance the way he needs to and build him up. They don't really prepare him, put him in, in the fire, give him to a start and change. He gets hurt for the year. It's over. And that's basically when it ended. Doc Purdy comes out of nowhere and becomes the wonderkin. He becomes the second coming of a uh, freaking Doug Flutie. But what the hell are we doing? I mean, the, it's it makes no sense to me. They could have stayed at 12 or whatever. They could have moved up a couple spots and got Justin Fields. They could have stayed at 12 and done Mac Jones, and I wouldn't have to deal with this right now. Uh, they could have... <laughs> done any number of things uh, outside of drafting Trey Lance. I mean, Zach Wilson now is sitting behind A.A. Ron likely for the next two years. Uh, you are the only player, only quarterback out of that class that theoretically has functionality is Josh's guy. But then he was basically the second coming of Peyton and or the not can't miss guy like Peyton or Andrew Luck. Um, so Jacksonville had that in their pocket, even with Urban Meyer being Urban Meyer, um, and having, uh, bulky there as well. It's a joke. And the Niners, uh, spent the whole summer and this whole off season being in the media with how they've handled this situation. And it's been an absolute clusterfuck. And to me, I am curious and I'm, I really want to see what this team is like on in week one, what kind of energy they have going to Pittsburgh and how they respond. Uh, because Kyle Shanahan 
the way he's handled this and the way he's talked in the media does not make me feel very confident about what the Niners can do this season. A lot of people are saying that they are a Super Bowl contender. I agree, but you need to have the team behind you to do that. You need to have 53 players or however many behind you that are going to all come as come together as one to carry that mission out. And the way Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch did this, I don't believe that's the case. And if you waste this opportunity, you have a three-year window now with Trey with this with Brock Purdy. If he ends up being that guy, we don't know. I like Brock Purdy. I have no problem with Brock Purdy. It's not about him. But if he if if it flames out with him, they're fucked. It's it's a it's a complete disaster. You can't draft a freaking who the hell are they going to draft? They can't draft Caleb Williams because the Arizona Cardinals are tanking for him. You know it's. Who the hell are you gonna get? It's I, I I don't like it. I can't imagine what Trey Lance felt. I feel bad for him. I mean, man, he's made a lot of money anyways. He gets to sit on the bench in Dallas. Jerry Jones gets to go and stick one to the 49ers. Uh, but it's just bad. And I don't like it. And I don't think Kyle Shanahan should be very proud of how he handled this situation. It gives me a lot of vibes to how he handled RG3 and basically ended his career. Not because I like RG3 as a person, but he was a dynamic player and basically let him get destroyed. And within the span of one year, he went from being the being a cover athlete on video games and the rookie of the year to being done. Uh, that's why Kirk Cousins became a thing. All right, I'm done with that. I... I don't want to talk about Kyle Shanahan, at least for a little while, because he's really douchey. And the way he handled that whole situation pisses me off. Uh, Indy next. Uh, getting a roundup, Indy next. Christian Rasmussen uh, comes in to this weekend's race at Portland with a 50-point uh, lead over Hunter McElray, uh, or McElray, however I pronounce it. I change it every time I say it. Jacob Abel, third in points. Nolan Siegel and Louis Foster rounding out the top five. The results at uh, at uh, what do you call at at Firestone out front showdown. Rasmussen won, led seventy of the race of seventy five laps. McElroy led the other five. Uh, Louis Foster finished in between there in second. Jacob Abel, Daniel Frost. Uh, rounded out the top five. Matthew Brabham was seventh. Ernie Francis Jr. eighth. Uh, what do you call? Uh, Jamie Chadwick ended up finishing twelfth. So we'll see what happens. There are two races to go in the Indy next season. Rasmussen on the cusp of a championship, but I'm not sure uh, what his uh, prospects are for uh, 2024 in an Indy car. I don't think the options are there as of now, unless he brings a little more budget to the table. Um, in uh, At VIR, Virginia International Raceway, Michelin GT Challenge, the Corvette Racing t- duo of Jordan Taylor and Antonio Garcia get the victory over Ben Barnacote and Jack Hawksworth in the Faster Sullivan Lexus. Madison Snow and Brian Sellers win GTD and finish third overall uh, in their Paul Miller Racing BMW. Another BMW, the Turner Motorsport car, a Robbie Foley and Patrick Gallagher finish second in class, fourth overall. Philip Ellis, Russell Ward, and a Windward Racing Mercedes, uh, third in class and fifth overall. The third place uh, finisher in GT Pro was Klaus Bockler and Patrick Pile in the FAF Motorsports Porsche, finished 12th overall. And uh, so that's... Uh, you know, Jordan Taylor, the fastest lap was actually run by Barnacote over Jordan Taylor. The And it was uh, Robbie Folier run the fastest lap in GTD over Madison Snow and Frederick Shandorf running the McLaren. Uh, the points, I mean, now we're running. They're going to be racing at Indianapolis in a couple of weeks' time, first time in a few years with that. So the points standings for... The uh, WeatherTech Sports Car Championship in uh, in the GTP category, 
uh, the number 10, what is it, Wayne Taylor, Andretti, Acura, leads by 14 points over Alexander Sims, Pippo Durrani, and the Whelan Cadillac, Nick Yellowly and Connor D. Filippi, uh, third, Jamine and Tandy in the Penske Porsche, fourth, and Tom Blomquist and Colin Braun, fifth, for Meyer Shank Racing. In LMP2, Ben Keating and Paul Loup Chatin lead by 45 points over Steven, Steven Thomas and Mikkel Jensen, Ben Hanley and George Kurtz in the CrowdStrike car, uh, third. Agar Robinson leads in uh, LMP3, trying to get another championship before they move to LMP2. In GTD Pro, um, Hawksworth Barnacote or lead the points over Garcia and Taylor. Oh, they didn't even put that. That's great. And uh, Jewel Gunan and Daniel Yunkadella uh, are in a close battle with Patrick Peeley and Klaus Bockler. And then in GTD, Sellers and Snow um, add to their points lead over uh, Roman DeAngelis, Marco Sorensen in the Hard Racing Aston and Shandorf and Brendan Rebe in the McLaren Inception car, Frankie Montecalvo, Aaron Tielitz in the Vassar Southern Lexus, and the Mercedes of Mike Skeen and Mikhail Renier. Formula 3 uh, comes back this weekend, and through because of qualifying uh, in ish, things that went on in qualifying, Gabriel Bortoletto becomes the champion, uh, he was going to win the championship anyway. It's the final three races, the final round of their season. So Gabriel Bortoletto is the champion uh, this year. It's though a very close race after that from second through sixth, only separated by 12 points. So Paul Aaron, uh, Pepe Marti, Zach O'Sullivan, Franco Colapinto, and Daniel Beganovic are all in a position, and that's you know key positions and points to go and possibly get the super license points to move up and even get possibilities of getting a Formula One uh, testing deal, uh, FP1 session. So something to watch there. Uh, in Formula Two, uh, standings going into this weekend, uh, coming off of Budapest, um, or what is it, where are we at? Why am I saying that? Or not Budapest. Going through Zanfort, uh, Clement Novalak won the feature race, uh, which is the, he'd only had two points the whole year, and that was at the first sprint race at, or that was at Baku, and then now he wins. So it doesn't affect anything in the points, but Pocher and Vesti didn't score. Top four guys didn't even score points over the entire weekend. Uh, second place was Zane Maloney, moves him up to ninth. Third was Jack Crawford, moves them up to a tie in, uh, for 11th with Cushmine. So we'll see what happens. Right now, the uh, two rounds, four total races, but two rounds to go, Monza, and then a long break before they race at uh, Abu Dhabi for their season finale. MotoGP coming back this weekend at Barcelona. Uh, FD1, 62 Point lead for Peko Bagnaia, trying to win his second consecutive championship for Ducati. Jorge Marti in second. Uh, Marco Bezzecchi announcing that he'll stay with uh, the VR46 team. Uh, is right now in third. Brad Binder, Johan Zarco, uh, who announced he's going to be running for LCR next year in Honda in fifth. Luca Marini, sixth. And Ali Shespargaro, uh, seventh. In uh, Moto... To the Moto 2 championship, uh, just out of the. I'm trying to go here. This this website is god awful. Uh, I'm trying to get the information, but it's hard to access it because they. Ins Ugh, this is ridiculous. I'm gonna. I don't. It's like I don't care. I know that. Well, I'll I'll see what happens in uh, next week for Moto 2. Uh, the, the, I know that, uh, the Americans in terms, they struggled, so uh, they have issues with the injuries and all that. So there's things they have to bring up with that. And then trying to find results, standings, uh, you know, so it doesn't bring, okay. 
There you go. And then Moto 2 Championship. Yeah, that's what I needed, but I, I'm not going to bother. Uh, the big go U.S. Nationals this weekend. They've already had qualifying earlier this evening. Uh, but, you know, you got guys out there. You want to win this race, guys and girls, uh, trying to go and win the big go. It means so much, kind of like the 500, the Daytona 500, Indianapolis 500, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you got event info uh, in, they don't list the number of cars. I mean, you have uh, Factory X, whatever the hell. Yeah, so that's a bunch of, okay, so a Dodge, a two Camaros, and a Ford Mustang. Greg Stanfield and Alan Johnson bringing it back old school. Hemi Challenge, a bunch of the old Plymouths and Dodges, so that's a cool category. Uh, Terry Earwood, that's a name from the past. Um, factory Stock Showdown, you have Aaron Stanfield, of course, who's running in Pro Stock. Mark Powick, the former Pro Stock racer for many years, going through there. Uh, looking at some of these other people, don't really know who any of those people are, so that's fine. And, uh, and go through that, go move through all of that. In Top Alcohol Dragster, uh, you have... Uh, nice field there but you also have uh number 314 uh his name is anthony wayne stewart uh driving his mobile one dragster and he wants to win the big go here this weekend but he has to race against a very tough field uh the likes of uh teammates and jasmine salinas and other ladies jackie frick uh, Julie Nottis, Madison Payne. I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of ladies in this category, so you got to give credit to them how good they're racing, too. You have Mike Coughlin, who's one of uh, Stewart's teammates as well. It's a tough, tough field trying to go and make the show, going and actually giving yourself a chance to win uh, this race. Pro Mod. Uh, you have, uh, I'm trying to see, uh, Ricky Smith in a Mustang, so that's cool. That's where they're. Um, other than that, there's three Fords, but a bunch of Chevys. And um, Pro Stock Motorcycle, you know, they're trying to lock in for the playoffs. They haven't been around in a month. Uh, but we, we're just focusing on Gage Herrera. Can he go and win at Indianapolis to add on to what has been a dominant rookie season for him? Or can one of these veteran guys like Matt Smith or Steve Johnson, A. Craywick, or um, Hector Rana come around and, and get the victory? Pro Stock Car, we know, has uh, been uh, a lot about Dallas Glenn this year, but Enders has won a bunch of times. Greg Anderson's won there a bunch of times. And you have young guns like Stanfield and Coughlin that want to get that first uh, Wally there amongst others and then funny car caps finally got over the hump and got the the win at indianapolis running a don perdome hot wheels throwback and then you got john force the ageless wonder robert height up there cruz pentagon uh tim wilkerson jr todd etc etc and top fuel dragster steve torrance who's number one right now um bob tasco is number one in funny car uh, you have Antron Brown's won multiple Indianapolis races. Austin Proc uh, trying to get that first win at Indy. Um, you look at Tony Schumacher who's won more races at Indianapolis than anybody. And um, got some other guys. Langdon who's won this race. Um, Doug Coletta, it would be, uh, it would be, I think it would be his 50th win if he were to get the win this weekend. So we'll see what happens with that. Formula One, the... Uh, Italian Grand Prix, the practice results uh, saw Fish Lips, um, uh, not fit, yeah, he uh, was the leader in practice one by 46 thousandths of a second over Carlos Sainz, the driver from Ferrari. Um, Checo Perez, third, Carlo, uh, Charles Leclerc, fourth, George Russell, fifth, Alonzo Norris, Hamilton, Sonoda, Albon rounds out the top 10, Logan Sargent was 12th. Liam Lawson, 13th. In practice two, Sainz over his former teammate Norris. Perez crashed in practice two, but was third. With his fast 
fastest lap, Piastri fourth, uh, Fishlips, Leclerc, Albon, Alonso, Russell, and Nico Hulkenberg. Um, Logan Sargent 16th and 17th was Lewis Hamilton. Liam Lawson 18th. And then there were problems for Lance Stroll, who had given up his car um, for practice one to the defending Formula 2 champion, Felipe Djokovic. Uh, let's go and look at the picks here. You had uh, first pick last week for uh, the Dutch Grand Prix, so I'll put Italian Grand Prix. <laughs> Phil Fishlips to win, and then uh, second place. I'm gonna go and put. Uh, I'm gonna end up. I'm gonna put Carlos. I'm gonna put Carlos Sainz. Why not? I I think Ferrari actually goes out there and uh, 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 Sainz keeps it going through the whole weekend. Uh, second and in third will be um, Oscar Piastri. What do you think, Josh? Who do you look at outside of Fish Lips to um, get on the podium? Well, uh, I'm actually going to go against the grain here, and I'm going to say that Max Verstappen actually doesn't win this weekend. Oh. Um, and the reason why I say that is um, not because I just don't want him to win, but, I mean, remember uh, 2020, you know, something happened to Lewis Hamilton during the race, and then... Um, um, Pierre Gasly ended up winning that one. And then 21 um, probably was going to be either Max or uh, uh, Lewis. Lewis Hamilton there. They took themselves out and, you know, ended up being that Ricardo got his only win for McLaren. So, you know, I think, you know, this race seems like things can happen. Um, you know, you talked about it earlier that Monza is kind of an equalizer race. Um, so that's kind of my thinking there. Um and I, you know, I think, I think the win streak for for Salpin kind of comes to an end here, but not because it just doesn't have the pace, but I think just um, some kind of bad luck will happen. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually gonna go Sergio Perez winning this oh. race, um, and then uh, I'll say Leclerc second here, um, leading the charge for Ferrari, and then then I'll say uh, Verstappen in third place. So. Um, as kind of a hedge so yeah that's kind of what i think um there i mean yeah it's way way different than you know what we've been saying the last couple of weeks and who knows i might be maybe i will probably be wrong but you know it's just kind of how i'm thinking here kind of going for the uh um chaos aspect here you know especially you know last couple of years at monza yeah it's uh valid definitely uh monza is one that can be a wild card uh, because of the arrow, because of the flat out uh, aspects, um, other things that come into play. I mean, the history there with in '88, for example, and uh, Enzo Ferrari passes away a few weeks before, and McLaren was on the way to winning every single race that year, and Jean Louis Schlesser gets in the way of Ayrton Senna, who was having issues and trying to save fuel. <laughs> Because Prost pushed him so hard, ended up falling out of the race. Uh, pushed him so hard, he needed to save fuel to make it, um, and then crashed out of the deal. And Ferrari ends up winning the Italian Grand Prix. So weird stuff happens at Monza. So why not? Uh, Portland. We have uh, one practice so far at uh, Portland uh, this weekend. I mean, they'll have another practice. On Saturday and then qualifying the um, so far I mean I mentioned the practice or I think I mentioned the practice results from uh, uh, from earlier today uh, Christian Lundgaard led over Kirkwood and Palo Pato Award fourth Felix Rosenquist was fifth Malukas Grosjean VK Rossi Newgarden the top ten uh, some of the other guys you'd look at, I mean, Erickson, 12th, McLaughlin, 16th, Power, 17th, Scott Dixon, 19th, and uh, Colton Hurdo's 20th. So, I mean, for me, for for the sake of interest and wanting it to keep going, uh, I'm going to pick Scott Dixon to win. Uh, he's gotten into a first lap incident at Portland and won. 
Uh, he's he's done it all, so why not? Why don't he go and win another one? Uh, while uh, Tom Blomquist hasn't had any pace so far, I figure he'll figure it out. I figure he'll figure. He, I think he has the ability to make improvements through the weekend. Uh, and I look at him as my wild card uh, choice, um, largely because I can't stomach picking Devlin DeFrancesco as my um, wild card in general. I, I just can't, and I won't. So those are my picks for Portland. Uh, or, you know what? You should have went first. My fault. You're mute. No, I mean, I went just now on the last one on the F1, so it's your... Yeah, but it's fine. Um, no, um, I mean, for me, the uh, pick for this weekend, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm just going to say that Alex Pillow wins and puts this whole championship to bed, you know, and everything. And because of the door on his teammate, you know, goes out there and proves. And, you know, I'm picking him and also, you know, I mean, it's kind of a projection also, you know, want to see him want to see him try to just close it out and everything kind of this chapter of his career and everything and move on to, um, you know, probably stay with, uh, um, Chip Ganassi, but just the, you know, move on from all the drama with McLaren and all that stuff. Uh, and then prove, you know, prove he can, um, close the deal when he's under pressure and everything. So, um, pick him there. But, um, for my, I guess my pick wild card wise, um, uh, yeah, I'll go with uh, Renus VK here. He had a decent time, uh, eighth place on the charts in practice one. Um, so, um, you know, let's kind of want to see how he does. You know, he's had a really bad struggle this year, hasn't really had the greatest season. So, yeah, let's see, you know, if he can take take his car and, you know, finish maybe top 10 uh, this weekend in Portland. Um, so, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, kind of maybe going out there a little bit, but, you know, I'm comfortable being able to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, Rina's VK, we know the kind of talent and ability he has, but, you know, I think he's been held back by the Ed Carpenter racing team and the issues that they've had in recent times, for sure. Um, we'll start with the Xfinity series here, uh, one of their shorter races of the season. Um, the... Sport Clips, Help a Hero 200, uh, under 47 laps, 39 cars, one will miss the race. Uh, they, let's see here, um, trying to look through some of uh, we got Weatherman in the four, with Smithley in the six. Stefan Parsons driving for SS Greenlight along with Chad Fincham. Uh, Justin Haley in the 10. Kyle Larson driving the Hendrick 17. Uh, Trevor Bain back in the 19 for Gibbs. Corey Heim in the 24 for Sam Hunt. Uh, trying to see some others. Uh, Ryan, yeah. uh, Sage Karam in the 44 uh, this weekend. Raja Karuth in the 45. Matt Mills driving for Emerling Gase. Timmy Hill in the uh, MBM Carl Long 66. Ross Chastain driving for DGM and the 91 car. Uh, so I'll, uh, I, or what is it? What did I say there? So you, uh, I went, I was supposed to go last there, but I went first, but whatever. I'll go and do it this, the, the or, orders this way. Uh, I'm going to end up going, I'm going to go with Sheldon Creed as my pick to win because uh, at some point, he has to win a freaking race. I mean, it's it's insane for the kind of talent he is. Um, and uh, his ability to drive on, like, slick and rough surfaces, he's he's really, really good at that. So, I mean, and he had a, he really should have won this race last year. Um, wild card for me, I'll go with Corey Heim. The Sam Hunt team is a, has had solid results throughout the year. So I, I, Corey Heim getting Xfinity series opportunities is is a good um, deal for him. So I'll go with uh, Creed to win uh, Heim wild card. What say you, Josh? You know I'm gonna go with Kyle Larson here. Um, 
interestingly enough, he is going against the car that won Kyle Busch driving this weekend uh, in the LA Golf number 10, but Kyle Larson in the number 17, so uh, HendrickCars.com Chevy, so I think it's going to be a very um, Kyle and Kyle show this weekend uh, at Darlington Raceway. Actually kind of cup heavy because uh, Denny Hamlin's in the 19 in the Sport Clips car uh, Toyota, so yeah, very cup heavy actually this weekend. Lots of cup guys, and you got Chastain, but I think Kyle Larson is going to be the best and be the winner here. Sweep the weekend here at Darlington. Um, well, not sweep the weekend, but um, sweep the Xfinity uh, schedule of races at Darlington since he won in the spring. Dramatic finish there with John Hunter Nemechek uh, there at the end. So I'll go with him. Uh, and then you know, as my wild card, uh, uh, can you remind me what the rule is again for the Xfinity series? Is it top 15? Uh, for Xfinity series that we're going with, or is it lower than that? I, th- I mean, it's all the people that have run the full season right now, so that's twenty. I, I'm putting in the likes of Kyle C. Brennan Pool, whatever. So the twenty-five Blaine Perkins, twenty-six. So I consider as twenty-six drivers that have basically run the entire year. So once you get past 13th, which is Jeb Burton, and he's won a race, I think anybody that's beyond that is considered a wild card uh, option. And while uh, Josh makes looks at his choice, uh, it does say Kyle Busch on the J-Ski site um, for the 10. It doesn't, I don't, it, I was thinking it would be Denny Hamlin, but it didn't show on the um entry list but it's entirely possible or highly likely because he is usually runs his one race of the season at darlington in the xfinity series i'm trying to look at the qualifying order just to confirm that but it shows um trevor bain so um they show justin haley in also in the qualifying thing so i mean larson is going to be the second car out in qualifying uh, at tomorrow morning, uh, probably put up a big number to go and get the poll. So I don't know what's going on with that. So we'll see. I guess we'll see on Saturday morning uh, when they qualify and pra- practice and qualify with that. Who do you have? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to go for wild card. Um, you know, I'll go with uh, Jeremy Clements here this weekend as my wild card. Um, South Carolina's own. Yeah, South Carolina boy, South Carolina. So yeah. Um, that'll be my wild card this weekend. All right. So um, we move to the Southern 500, one of the majors, a race that uh, everybody wants to win. If you're a Cup Series driver, means a lot. Um, and it's it's a absolute challenge and a beast of a racetrack. 367 laps around uh, the lady in black. You know, uni shippers for... Ross Chastain, discount tire for Sindrick, Morgan and Morgan for Bald Spot Dylan, Mobile One Take Five, which is kind of a throwback for Harvick, HendrickCars.com, well, yeah. Um, Solomon Plumbing for Keselowski, Gainbridge for LaJoy, McLaren Custom Grills for Kyle Busch, um, Sport Clips for Denny Hamlin, Richmond Water Heaters, Menards for Blaney, highpoint.com lady in black scheme for chase briscoe so instead of it being blue for high point it'll be all black uh yaley in the 15 for where almondinger i don't know what his sponsor will be busher will be in the build submarine 17 bass pro uh for truex yahoo for bell motorcraft quick lane this weekend because it's darlington for burton uh, mcdonald's for bubba wallace liberty for byron Stage front VIP for Michael McDowell, Quincy Compressor for Todd Gilliland, Haas back on the 41 for Priest. Uh, Carson Hosovar uh, looks like is going to be running this whole entire round for Legacy Motor Club in the 42. And um, Jordan Brand for Tyler Reddick, Boost by Kroger and Irish Spring for o Richard, uh, Parts Plus and Biohaven for No Neck. Monster Energy for Keebler, Ray's Energy, Blue Shock for uh, Ty Dillon, Affliction Clothing for BJ McLeod, and Freeway.com for Daniel Suarez. Okay, so um, Josh, you 
and did Xfinity picks. Uh, so you get to open the board here for the Southern 500. Uh, who do you look at to win this first race of the playoffs? And who is your wild card? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think I'm going to go with um, Ross Chastain winning this weekend, which is a bold pick. But, you know, he did have a good car here in the spring. And, you know, they seem to be in a better position you know, after having kind of struggles um, early this season and through part of the mid portion of the year. But, you know, they were in position to win this race uh, back in the spring and, uh, yeah, this track. So I'm going to go with him uh, as my uh, pick to win this weekend. You know, it's a bold statement, but, you know, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and then, um, I mean, my wild card pick. I mean, may as well be picking people who are out of the chase or out of the playoffs now, um, considering and everything. So, um, yeah, I'll go with uh, Ty Gibbs as my wild card this weekend. Yeah, definitely a, a good one because, I mean, they did make a pit crew swap, the 20 and the 54. 54 team has been one of the best pit crews uh, the whole year. And now for Christopher Bell trying to actually win a championship, he's been affected by bad pit stops all year. So something to look at for Keebler. Keebler uh, wild card. All right, for me, I'm going to pick... Eh, I am looking at... Because it would be a big momentum uh, boost for somebody if they're able to go and get this victory to start the playoff run unlike last year i don't think uh outside playoff driver is going to win i think a veteran playoff driver will and um i think that pick is going to be dennis hamlin uh it's one of his better racetracks of course um i didn't know that the chevys were were dominant in the spring but denny hamlin usually wakes up for the Southern 500. Uh, it's really an endurance test. So he considers himself one of the better, more fit drivers in that, in that case. My wild card selection, uh, I'm going to go with... I'm going to go with... Um, why not? He's out of the playoffs. I'll go with uh, William Clyde Elliott II. Um, so as a wild card... Because you know uh, he could go out there and win, he could go and win a bunch of races, and he could put himself in position to win the owners' championship uh, at at Phoenix, like uh, Larson did last year. Uh, if he goes out there and can win every round, so see what happens with that. Uh, for before we go and open the, the the floor for Josh talking about all things sim racing in his segment i was able to go on a cruise i mean we josh and i were able to meet up since i was in florida family vacation went to the waffle house that was not as it wasn't as entertaining but that was because it was early in the morning um there was white trash stuff that was going on but it wasn't as funny um but the breakfast was good we got to hang out so that was cool uh josh as he mentioned went to daytona for the race and with friends and also met up with Joe. I spent uh, the better part of my cruise that was going to the Bahamas um, racing in a Formula One simulator, and uh, that was definitely fun. I kept on improving every day. Uh, I look like a complete shit, shit for brains at the start of it, but as I kept on getting more laps and taking more time around the track, got better to the point where... My fastest lap was a 107. It wasn't a real track. I mean, I think it had seg uh, the makings of a real track or corners from different places, but it, 107 was my fast time. The fast guy who I saw actually run the one night, and he was wasted, uh, ended up putting up a 102. So he had a lot of experience, but then his family said that he has a sim rig at home. So I didn't feel so bad about it when the guy is experienced, whether he was wasted or not. So uh, I enjoyed it. It was real fun. It was a, a old style F1 car, kind of from like the 20, 
14-ish, you know, times uh, when they made the changes to the arrow and whatever. Uh, I think that was where that car came from, that chassis and bulkhead. So it was, a, and it looked go- cool as well. But it was, yeah, the regular kind of Formula One style steering wheel with all the buttons and stuff, but you didn't really use any of them. Um, the they did sequential box, of course, but then they also were shifting automatically. So there was times when I ran the lap with them going and shifting, and times when they didn't. The steering and the pedals and using all that was intense. So I get what Josh talks about when he's racing in these big races. It's it's definitely a blast, and you get a workout out of it for sure. Uh, I had fun doing it, and I wish I could have one myself. So it's something that I can aim for. Uh, Josh, let us know what's going on in the world of iRacing and gaming in your sim segment. Yeah, I mean, this week, well, yeah, this week in iRacing, um, Dar- Darlington's on the schedule for uh, all NASCAR Cup truck and Xfinity Series. Uh, and I think the last special event of the year is uh, the Southern 500 for um, those competing in the NASCAR iRacing Series. So that's a full-length race there, so I'm sure there'll be people doing that um um i'm not really that great at darlington so um i won't be doing it i tried darlington i think earlier this year or last year and i just crashed a bunch so it's definitely a tough track the track that track that is too tough to tame so um you know i gotta gotta get better there um to feel competitive enough to you know compete in it but um and not get lapped at least but um yeah, I think yeah they released the 1987 car in iRacing, racing the um, Pontiac Granite Grand Prix. So another one there. They have four 1987 cars now: the Monte Carlo SS, Thunderbird, uh, Buick LeSabre, I think, and now the Pontiac Grand Prix. So um, I've sticked to the Ford so far because I like how fast it is, especially on the super speedways. Um, but it definitely does have a handling issue where it gets too loose at some points. So wonder if maybe going to the Pontiac Grand Prix or something like that might change um, my luck there sometimes. So we'll see how that goes. I might have to check that one out. And then also um, they released the Acura uh, GTP prototype uh, for, you know, for this year for uh, Wayne Taylor Racing, their their specific uh, car. So um, I've tried out the Cadillac GTP uh, at another sim rig uh, that had iRacing on it. So... Um, going to have to try that one out, um, possibly with, uh, the Acura car, see how different it is. Uh, definitely like the Cadillac one is definitely a challenge to drive. So definitely expect the same from, uh, the Acura one. Um, and actually, you know, it's actually cool because we, um, um, have an Acura car actually now in iRacing. So that's kind of fun. Um, uh, obviously I'm an Acura guy in real life. So, um, you know, driving one, so, you know, having an Acura car in the game, that might actually be kind of cool. So have to check that one out um you know nascar i'm in the fords um because yeah, that's what family car was growing up but um uh you know my own car is an Acura, so definitely uh try to um be in that but you know having a Acura car having some representation there in iRacing, racing definitely fun um so definitely you know i have to take a look at uh that one um i think yeah i think the rest of the schedule i want to say um I want to say that IndyCar is competing at Kansas this weekend, so um, the, at least the fixed oval series, and then you, know, you got your all your road course classes as well. Um, I don't have my schedule on me actually, but uh, I racing, um, and I'm actually away away for the weekend. But um, you know, last yeah, the Daytona is this or. Darlington, sorry, is this week on the Cup side and all on the NASCAR side. So, yeah, that should be definitely interesting. Um, we'll say, though, that last week before, you know, going to Daytona, I did some Daytona racing on my own in iRacing. And um, iRacing uh, was definitely fun with the Xfinity car um, racing there. Um, you know, kind of just played it patient, you know, played played the patient game and was able to get up all the way up into second on the final restart and, you know, give the guy a push, uh, try to go for the win. Um, although I think the caution came out on the final, on the, um, not the final lap, but the, uh, 
uh, you know, on the restart to the final lap, so wasn't able to get anything going there to try to make a win, you know, make a run for the win. But, um, you know, running running second at, you know, Daytona is fine, especially with, you know, how many crashes uh, that happen. And then, you know, on the cup side, um, kept it clean, and then also got into second on the uh, restart for the final lap. And then a couple guys in front of me took themselves out, spun into the grass, but they didn't throw the caution, kept going. Um, tried to make a run off of two to the inside, but um, got too close to the rear quarter pound of the leader and got too close to the yellow line and got below the yellow line and then went to the grass and then everybody else started wrecking. So not ideal there, but whatever, you know, it's Daytona, you know, you have one where you finish well and the other one where you don't finish that well. So that's, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. But um, um, yeah, I mean, definitely gonna look at that. Um, um, probably gonna have to start focusing on some kart racing as well. Um, probably do some more, you know, kart sim to try to try to, you know, get more comfortable with that to, um, you know, do real life karting and stuff. So we'll see how that goes. But, um, yeah, definitely glad you got to, you know, we got to meet up and, you know, go to Waffle House and all that stuff. And you know, also, um, kind of, kind of fun that you, you know, got to be able to do the full from one simulator there on, on the cruise ship. So, you know, I guess, uh, that's something to look forward to. Hopefully, hopefully whatever cruise ship, you know, um, if I go on a cruise in the future, um, you know, hopefully there's something on there like that that I can do. So that'd definitely be a lot of fun. And I, you know, I have to agree, I'd probably try to hit that up the whole time and, you know, maybe, um, you know, challenge some of the other racers on there. So that'd be kind of interesting. So, um, yeah, as always, um, you know, glad to, glad to be able to get on, you know, for another week and everything. And, um, of course, uh, you know, you can watch the streams when you do stream Twitch TV slash, uh, UCLR2 on there and, uh, Twitter, JP Huffine. Um, and then, uh, you know, our YouTube page, uh, YouTube at Grocery Podcast, go in there and, you know, see our takes and everything, see, you know, what we have to say in the video format of this show and, um, go in there, like and subscribe and comment and, and, you know, interact and all that stuff. So, you know, of course, you know, glad to be able to do it. And, you know, again, you know, being able to take the opportunity to meet up, glad to be able to do it, you know, hopefully, hopefully in the future sometime, you know, maybe me, you and Joe can do something or something like that. So, you know, kind of, kind of cool that we all got to you know link up um during different points of the day and you know ours was planned and then you know joe out of nowhere you know being able to meet up with him of course you know as always with my friends so yeah thanks uh thanks for all that so um yeah we'll close the show here yep absolutely uh it was great to finally meet up i mean we've known each other for like 10 years or something between those nascar pages and stuff so finally get to hang out uh get some breakfast and shoot the breeze it was cool and hopefully we can definitely do it uh again or whether it's rolex or some other race next year um as we go on um i definitely want to we could all do it you know as a crew that would be nice because go do the die cast hunt go and you know see whatever else probably be a good deal uh you can find me at uh pg matthew 28 on twitter or x whatever at grip strip pod is our uh, handle for um, the show we're on uh, josh handles youtube side uh, with the video feeds uh, we post a show on Podbean, and it appears basically anywhere you get you can get podcasts uh, also on philipgmatthew.com uh, you can go and find uh, the grip strip podcast and listen to all the episodes there. Uh, so we'll be back next week for episode 185 of the Grip Strip Podcast, going over all things Darlington, Portland, Monza, and more. Um, the U.S. Nationals uh, previews for the NFL, um, talk about the round of 16 for Cup, and make, make the picks because we were went a little long so we'll go and uh, make our picks for who's going to advance into the second round um as well so for josh i'm phil thanks for listening to grip your podcast um like subscribe the whole deal we'll see you next week